Namaskar and a very warm welcome to everyone who has come together today to attend the international webinar on holistic nutrition for healthy aging, translating science to practice. This webinar is jointly organized by the Nutrition Society of India, Mumbai chapter, and Dr. Bhanu Ben Mahendra Nanavati College of Home Science, Mumbai, in collaboration with Kellogg's India. With an aim to achieve our Honorable Prime Minister's vision of a Suposhit Bharat, a malnutrition-free India, the Rashtriya Portion Ma, National Nutrition Month, is being celebrated from 1st to 30th September through the length and breadth of our nation. This year, we are celebrating the fourth Rashtriya Portion Ma with a comprehensive theme converging towards a healthy walk through life. With a focus to achieve holistic nutrition, four basic themes over four weeks have been identified. The first week is on promotion of nutrition gardens or portion vaticas. The second week on yoga and Ayush for nutrition. The third week for distribution of nutrition kits to Anganwadi beneficiaries. And the fourth week is in identifying severe acute malnutrition in Indian children and offering nutrition support through dietary diversity. We sincerely hope that the learning from today's webinar will give each and every one of us an impetus to participate in a Jan Andolan towards improving nutritional outcomes in all stages of our population. It is now my proud privilege to invite Professor Dr. Mala Pandurang, Principal of Dr. BMN College of Home Science, Mumbai, a visionary, a seasoned academician, and a leader to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, Mala, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lakshmi, and a very good afternoon. On behalf of uh, Dr. BMN College of Home Science, I extend a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Dr. Kamala Krishnaswamy, plenary speakers, Dr. Rocks, Dr. Graves, Dr. Sabnis, office bearers of NSI, invited guests, faculty, and participants. Allow me to begin by sharing some information about our institution. Dr. BMN College is an autonomous college under SNDT Women's University, Mumbai with a NAT grade of A+, 3.69 out of 4. We are the only college in Mumbai to have been awarded a STRIDE UGC grant set up a research capacity center. And we are also recipient of a RUSA grant of 5 crores under the Enhancing Quality and Excellence in Select Autonomous Colleges scheme. Our Food Science and Nutrition Department is well established for over 30 years and offers both postgraduate and undergraduate programs. And the department is known for a range of activities related to the field of nutrition and women's health, including an international project with the University of Southampton and collaborative work with IIT Mumbai, as well as numerous local social outreach programs on community nutrition. We have alumni who are lead dietitians, not only in India, but internationally. And our faculty too are known for their research acumen and publications. We value our collaboration with NSI on a number of ventures over the years, including two international conferences, faculty involvement in developing modules for training purposes, our students of our MSc program of clinical nutrition, I work on nutrition awareness programs and prevention of malnutrition, and also contributed to preparing recipes for school children. Other projects with the NSI include anthropometric measurement sessions for school children, research competitions such as breastfeeding, as well as a webinar on COVID in children. And I would like to express my gratitude to the NSI Mumbai chapter. Dr. Subhadra, the convener, convener of the Mumbai chapter, 
retired principal of Dr. Bierman, Mrs. Anuradha Shekhar, who is a secretary, Dr. Vina, who has been very closely associated with our college in many ways, our sponsors, Kellogg's, and all our resource people, for including Dr. Bierman as a co-organizer for today afternoon's international webinar on a topic that is becoming increasingly important in contemporary I too am looking forward to listening and learning from our eminent speakers in the course of time. Thank you once again, and I wish you all a very educative and informative talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mala, for setting the pace to today's webinar with your inspiring words. Dr. Shubhadra Mandalika has been leading the NSI team towards constant successes a passionate researcher and experienced academician in the field of nutrition. She's presently an associate professor in the Department of Food, Nutrition and Dietetics at the College of Home Science, Nirmala Niketan, Mumbai. Ma'am, as convener of the NSI Mumbai chapter, I request you to kindly deliver a brief activity of the NSI Mumbai chapter. I also request you to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker, Dr. Kamla Krishnaswamy, to the August gathering. Thank you very much, Dr. Lakshmi, for your kind words. Good afternoon, everybody. Respected Professor Dr. Mala Panduran, Principal, Dr. BMN College of Home Science, Mumbai, eminent speakers of the day, Dr. Kamala Krishnaswamy, Dr. Tithyana Rocks, Dr. Kathy Greaves, Dr. Mukun Sabnis, and other experts from various fields who graced the occasion, and of course, my dear enthusiastic participants. On behalf of the Nutrition Society of India, Mumbai chapter, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome each one of you to the first intellectual event that we are organizing today to celebrate the National Nutrition Month 2021. Firstly, I would like to thank our headquarters, Nutrition Society of India, for granting us permission to organize this event along with various other events throughout and encouraging us in our endeavors to reach out to the community at large. And I must place on record the outcome of the sincere dedicated efforts of our local executive committee, working committee and social media team in converting the COVID-19 pandemic into an opportunity and contributing their best as nutritionists uh, to the, uh, to, through the chapter. I would like to take you through a few glimpses of our activities and then proceed to the to my uh, task of uh, to my very pleasant task of introducing the distinguished guests nutrition society of india as you all know is a highly reputed organization which strives towards public health and nutrition in our country we are making several constructive efforts in this lockdown period. As I told you, we almost have converted this lockdown period into a period of opportunity and reached out to large community through our online activities. One of the activities which I must make a mention here is, a, is an online training program that we have conducted in collaboration with Foundation for Medical Research for doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers who were stationed in Palghar. But, uh, and we have also developed various modules in English as well as Marathi, which are published by FMR. And this is a very proud event that we have organized and that has been very highly appreciated. And we have continued our efforts to disseminate evidence-based information through our social media posts and which are published through various social media handles like Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And I'm very, happy to present before you the number of likes and followers that our channels have. And of course, there are uh, around 85% of women from India and abroad are our followers. And we are able to reach out to the community both within and outside our country. And various social media posts which are prepared on evidence-based information have been compiled together in the form of an album and we have uploaded it on our website for a free download. And we also have prepared a 
knowledge base of indigenous nutritious recipes that we have collected from our members belonging to various regions of India. This has been done in response to the invitation from Ministry of Family Welfare, Government of India during the last uh, National Nutrition Month. And even this has been, we have converted into a book and we have uh, uploaded it on our website for free download once again. We have conducted over a period, like during the entire pandemic period, we have conducted about 45 plus webinars, which includes three webinar workshop series. And these series are mainly intended to help the young researchers develop their research skills, uh, both in the techniques of research, both qualitative as well as quantitative research, as well as research writing. So we look forward to various other activities and we have great plans to conduct several more activities uh, in the, uh, in future. And coming to today's webinar, which is Holistic Nutrition for Healthy Aging, Translating Science to Practice. This title we have finalized well ahead of time, but we, it is a very pleasant surprise to us that it is definitely in line with the main theme of National Nutrition Month that has been announced by the government that is converging towards a healthy walk through life. And we are addressing the aging population almost like the tomorrow of our nation. And to deliberate on this, we have eminent speakers with us, both international as well as national. And we have very eminent, internationally known, distinguished expert to deliver the keynote address today with us. And she is none other than Dr. Kamala Krishnaswamy, former director of National Institute of Nutrition, ICMR. It has been the dream of our chapter to host Madam on our platform and benefit ourselves from her expertise as well as benefit all the participants. Dr. Kamala Krishnaswamy is a senior honorary, honorary advisor for the Department of Food and Nutrition, Madras Diabetes Research Foundation. She is member of the Scientific Advisory Committee for updating the dietary guidelines for Indians and the Scientific Advisory Committee of NIM. Under her chairmanship, the dietary guidelines for Indians was prepared for the very first time in the year 1998, which was revised in 2011. All the academicians from the nutrition field and all those from the healthcare field, they all are very well versed with, this, the, with the use of this particular book. It is highly circulated and used. And not only this, she continued her efforts by being a member of ICMR NIN expert committee and worked towards uh, development of nutrient requirements for Indians, RD and ER, which was released recently in the year 2020. She has established the Advanced Center for Preclinical Toxicology at the Food and Drug Toxicology Center in NIM. Madam's research contributions are very wide. It's impossible to cover all her contributions to nutrition research. And I must say that she is a believer of taking lab to land. So she believed very strongly in integrating laboratory, clinical, and community research into practical relevance. We really, uh, if it is an offline, you would have received very um, high applause for your contribution, ma'am. But even online, we express our gratitude to you. Her valuable research has resulted in over 285 research articles and re reviews in several national and international journals. She has also edited books and contributed chapters to several books. All her publications are continuously benefiting the nutrition fraternity. And Madam's uh, reputation as a researcher has been duly recognized by prestigious academia, including International Union of Nutritional Sciences and the World Academy of Sciences. And her expertise, because of her expertise, several awards have been bestowed upon her, including the award which is considered to be the highest award that is highest of, um, honor that is Dr. Gopalan Centenary Award by Nutrition Society of India. Various professional societies have had the privilege of having Dr. Madam as the member, including Nutrition Society of India, for which she has been elected twice as president of the society. Along with this, she was on the Federation of Asian Nutrition Societies, and she was also on the Executive Committee member of National Academy of Medical Sciences. We have, I'm sure all of you will agree with me that we have the most suitable person to speak on aging and nutrition, an overview and the way forward. And I humbly request Dr. Kamala Krishnaswamy 
to deliver the keynote address for today's webinar. Madam, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Subhadra, for that very kind introduction. And I don't know whether I really deserve uh, the praise which you have showered on me. I hope I'll come up to your expectations. I must congratulate you for uh, having held so many webinars as well as workshops during the pandemic and also during the heavy monsoons of Bombay, which is well known. I, I think the Nutrition Society would have been very greatly interested. All the members of the Nutrition Society would have been interested. Students, uh, teachers, researchers would have been greatly benefited by all the subjects which you have chosen for this webinar. I really congratulate you and Thanks. all your colleagues. Thanks. I'm very happy this meeting is hosted by you as well as uh, uh, Dr. Mala Pandurangan. I'm very happy that a home science college is associated with the meeting as well. And of course, Kellogg's is also participating. Well, now I'll start uh, sharing my screen. Uh, I, I have structured my talk uh, in keeping with your uh, 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 theme of this uh, particular meeting. And I've said, I've structured it as aging, nutrition, and an overview and the way forward. Well, as you yourself have suggested, nutrition is a major factor in health and disease. And uh, from, I should say, from preconception to death. Instead of saying womb to tomb, I had put in a better word, preconception to death. Now let's look, take a look at the WHO statistics on aging. They have noted a very significant shift from 2015 onwards in the, the, the rate at which the people are aging. Uh, the world population over 60 years will double from almost 12 to 22 percent from 2015 to 2025. By 2050, world population of 60 years is expected to 2 billion, and of which more than 80 years, there will be 400 million. Uh, this number will, in fact, uh, outnumber the children younger than five years, which is not a, really a good sign, I should say. And most of the older people will be living in, in low and middle income countries. It's a major challenge to ensure their health and their social systems are geared to this change. I've given the life expectancy in India over here. From 1950 onwards, life expectancy has been increasing, but it's still below the global average. It's around 70.4 years, uh, 69 and uh, 71 in males and females, respectively. I would like you to concentrate on uh, what I have given in, in here. Only 21.4% receive pension in India. And the rest are all, uh, they don't receive any pension. They have to stay with their family or whatever they have earned and saved, they have to depend on it. And 5% of these live alone. So the dependency ratio will increase from 9.8 in 2019 to 20.3 in 2050. Now, these are the projections. And um, you can see here, the Indian population has approximately tripled during the last 50 years and the elderly have also increased. And the increased longevity of geriatric people is, would be associated with the number of chronic disorders, of course, including frailty in the elderly. Both aging, that is risk factor for age-related diseases, and age-related uh, diseases themselves are related to nutrition and lifestyle. Here is an age distribution in India. The population in 2011, looks like a very nice pyramid, but when you go on to 2036, the higher ages are expanding. Probably by 2050, it will uh, become like a barrel. In fact, in 2019, the population had 139 million elderly, 10% of the population. By 2050, it will be almost around 19.5 or 20%. So one in five will be an elderly person. 
Well, definition of aging is nothing but a progressive physiological change in an individual, which leads to decline of biological function and poor functional performance. It, it can begin in a cell and of course go on to tissue, organ, ultimately the total body is affected. The sequential or progressive change leads to dependence, increased uh, risk of debility, disease, and ultimately death. Even in healthy and active people, strength, endurance, bone density, flexibility, all decline at a rate of approximately 10% per decade, and muscle power is uh, lost faster at the rate of about 30% per decade. And senescence, of course, consists of manifestations of aging. What are the determinants of aging? There are several. In fact, I feel it's, a her it's going to be a Herculean task to address all determinants of geriatric care. Starting from economic independence to public health measures, the Asian phenotype, the thin fat Indians, already there is more fat and less muscle in Indians. Food and nutrition, security, availability, accessibility, affordability, inappropriate health behaviors in terms of habits such as alcohol and tobacco, sedentary lifestyles, all of them put together, they decline in physiological, biochemical or metabolic and hormonal changes leading to functional deficits. Polypharmacy and drug neutron interactions further add to the problems. Now, if you look at the social cultural factors, there are many, retirement, relocation, death of partners, siblings, friends, isolation, enhanced psychosomatic problems, stress induced mostly, but otherwise also anxiety, depression, and dementia occurs in elderly. Even issues associated with food procurement and preparation impacts the nutrient intakes. Then it's bedridden caretakers associated problems. There are so on and so forth. There are many things which requires to be attended to. Therefore, there, need to, there should be reinforced recovery, adaptation, and promote psychosocial, psychosocial social interactions. Uh, the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment is a nodal ministry for welfare of the senior citizens. They have some policies. We'll see that later. I just want to say a word about hallmarks of aging. I certainly don't want to go into the theories of aging. Actually, uh, I'm not an expert in this, nor can we finish this in this particular lecture. I only wanted to bring to your notice the fact there are about nine hallmarks of aging, starting from genomic instability to cellular problems and altered intercellular communication as well. What is important perhaps is healthy dietary patterns and physical activity can positively influence one or more of these hallmarks and increase longevity and disease risk. That's why I thought I will uh, project this particular slide. It's not possible for me to go into the details. Now, what are the dietary practices for holistic nutrition health? As defined, eating healthy foods close to natural state for optimum health and well being is important. Physical, chemical, nutritional, emotional, and spiritual well being are included in it. Therefore, the healthy dietary practices must begin very early in life. Uh, diversity of diet promote active, healthy life and productivity. Of course, all of you know the quality, quantity of foods, uh, macro, micro, phytonutrients, consistent with age, gender, these are all important things. It not only sustains growth and development, but uh, it impacts cognition, muscle, bone, gut, eye health, reduces fat accumulation, promotes immunity, and defends against infections and inflammation. That, that's what uh, holistic nutrition does. And... Um, Unhealthy diets are risk factors, enhancing disease and disability, and also promote transgenerational effects, the Asian healthy, the, the Asian phenotype, which is an unhealthy phenotype. Sustainable development goal three concentrates on well-being of the elderly too. Now, what is a healthy diet? I've given here. This is it is uh, true for across across the population, including the elderly. It should provide non-glycemic carbohydrates like whole grains and fiber, good quality proteins, good quality fats, such as low fat dairy, nuts and seeds and plant oils, uh, mostly unsaturated, specifically, especially monounsaturated fatty acids should be in 
fairly good amounts. People don't concentrate on that. Everybody talks about N6 and N3, but MUFA is also important. Of course, N6 and N3 are also important. Plenty of vegetables and fruits to provide for vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. They are also called telomere protective. I, I did project about the telomeric attrition in the hallmarks of aging. Telomeres are nothing but two ends of the chromosomes uh, carrying the message. And uh, they shorten uh, very much during the aging process. And at some point of time, they no longer uh, uh, can function properly. Minimal processed food and fortified foods when essential are, uh, can be taken, but otherwise it's better to take natural food. Low salt, sugar, fat, snack foods, and minimum beverages, particularly the sugar sweetened and carbonated. Are, uh, you should stress on these things because it should not be taken, particularly by the elderly. And replace all these things by healthy snacking, like fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds. These things could be used. Spices and herbs, to enhance the taste and palatability is good. Some of the spices are also have uh, functional benefits and plenty of water to avoid dehydration. Now, what are the problems in uh, 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 health problems in elderly? There are many. In fact, it impacts the entire body, starting from loss of taste, smell, nausea, appetite, GI disturbances, even bioavailability of nutrients are much less decreases appetite, food and nutrient intake. There are eye disorders from cataract to macular degeneration, hearing loss, arthritis, poor bone health, sarcopenia. Of these, bone health and sarcopenia are extremely important for the elderly because they cannot maintain their mobility, balance, and can result in increased fractures. A whole lot of non-communicable diseases and neurogenerative diseases I've mentioned over here. Overweight and obesity, of course, predisposes to everything. It's not a disease per se, but it predisposes to all the diseases. 80% have one and 60% have two or more chronic conditions, leading to poor choices of healthy foods. Now, I have on, there are many studies, particularly in chronic disorders. I have chosen the one which has been done recently by the Union Ministry of Health and Family Welfare 2020. Uh, these are the prevalence rates of all the chronic diseases which are given over here. Cardiovascular disease uh, are 34.6, they predominate, followed by hypertension, and then of course uh, diabetes, chronic lung diseases, neuropsychiatric problems, etc. Two in three suffer from some chronic disease, 23% have multiple morbidities. And women have more multiple uh, more, more morbid conditions. And about 4% of the total burden of the disease will be borne by the elderly by 2030. It, it has also been shown visual impairment. It's 4% is the most common morbidity followed by hearing impairment. Now let's look uh, briefly look at the body composition. The most important is muscle loss. Sarcopenia with 20 to 40 percent loss of skeletal muscles results in physical disability, frailty, poor quality of life. It decreases the physical activity and BMR 2 to 4 percent per decade from 30 to 80 years. And muscle power, in fact, is lost faster at the rate of about 30 percent per decade. I've already mentioned that. Then there is an increase in the fat mass as also the redistribution to the visceral regions or abdominal regions, which are risk factors for so many disorders. It can infiltrate into muscle and bone. That's why it's called osteosarcopenic obesity syndrome. And it results in increased inflammation. Inflammation is uh, one of the important features for all chronic disorders. And of course, there is bone loss, osteopenia and osteoporosis. So management actually is uh, a nutrient intervention only, protein rich diet, relatively rich in protein, vitamin D and calcium and increase in physical activity are essential. I've just got uh, some urban and uh, rural national nutritional monitoring bureau data over here. Sorry for the little bit of crowding of the slides. Uh, the majority of elderly in rural and tribal areas are subsisting on inadequate diets. And uh, 
the median intakes of micronutrients such as vitamin A, iron, riboflavin, folate are grossly deficient as compared to RDAs among both genders. And the prevalence of choric energy deficiency, below, BMI below 18.5, was relatively higher in tribals as compared to the rural population. The male-female percentages are given in this slide. And uh, in NMB urban data, uh, the median intake of many nutrients among urban elderly were meeting the RDA, except vitamin A, calcium, riboflavin, zinc in male and female respectively. Now, I have given the percentages here, 27, 26. The first one is males and the second one is females. The prevalence of chronic energy deficiency is much less as compared to the um, rural India, 10 and 13%, while obesity is much higher, 33 and 47% among men and women, respectively. Well, we do not have large-scale studies with biochemical markers on... Uh, micronutrient deficiencies, except of course for intake of intakes as calculated by NNMB. I've clubbed all, there are isolated studies, many isolated studies, so I've clubbed all of them together. And you can see here reduced immunity due to vitamin, vitamin B complex deficiency produces reduced immunity, cognitive impairment, cardiovascular diseases, depression, even glucose intolerance is uh, mentioned cellular aging, telomere shortening is very characteristic. Fat-soluble uh, vitamins, uh, vitamin D, is, sar sarcopenia and decline in physical function is extremely important, apart from, of course, some hormonal changes. Vitamin C, Alzheimer's, cataract, reduce immunity. It has been shown that it's important to keep appropriate intake of vitamin C. And microminerals, zinc, selenium, calcium, chromium, copper, manganese have all been mentioned in relation to the various disorders which I have shown here, osteoporosis, immune senescence, macular degeneration, including Alzheimer's. Now, macro, I just thought I'll touch on a macronutrient requirement. I'm, I'm sorry, we do not really have, though we have given the recommended dietary allowances in the new nutrient requirement books released in 2020. We need to do more work as far as elderly are concerned. Energy requirement, of course, gradually decreases between the ages of uh, 30 and 75 years. Uh, and uh, because of the changes in lean body mass and reduction in physical activity, there will be a decrease in energy intake. The suggested, what is suggested for adults only, I have given over here. We need to work out even the weights of the elderly and also the calorie requirement, but I've compared it with the adults over here in male and female. And uh, the acceptable macronutrient ranges are indicated here. Protein 12 to 15%, this works out to be 0.80 grams per kg body weight and one gram uh, per, per kg body weight. And carbohydrates, of course, uh, the 45 to 65% of energy, the lesser it is, it's better. But if you reduce too much on a cereal pulse weight diet, it's very difficult. And then we have to replace it with appropriate nutrients, maybe uh, protein. Total fats is between 15 and 35%. Now, I have indicated here, these I have collected from Western data and calculated for energy of 17 and, uh, I mean, uh, for the energy indicated for males and females, it works out to be anywhere with the, for the body weight, 18 energy percent and 30 energy percent. This seems to be very high. Now, protein requirements in sarcopenia have also been worked out elsewhere. Uh, as I've said, we do not have studies. 1 to 1.2 grams per kg has been mentioned with 20 to 35 grams of protein per meal. And to prevent slow sarcopenic muscle mass, uh, 25 to 30 grams of high quality protein per meal has been mentioned to improve the uh, protein synthesis in the muscle. And uh, specifically, people have mentioned on amino acid leucine to stimulate anabolism. Um, beyond this, I think the expert who's going to speak on uh, protein would take care of the things uh, because we do not have studies in India. The micronutrient requirements also are, uh, we have, uh, the, there has been a status paper prepared recently by NIN, and only suggested intakes have been suggested here, those which can be increased like vitamin D, B6, 
B12, vitamin C, calcium. I, I, I'm not specifying how much to increase. Unless we do the studies it's, it's, or collect some data, it's not possible. And uh, I don't think we have enough data also. Iron, of course, would be low, while uh, magnesium, phosphorus, zinc should be higher. And sodium certainly should be reduced because we have uh, hypertension is a widely prevalent disorder. Now, let me speak uh, briefly about health benefits of physical activity, because whenever you speak on uh, diet, it's important to see that it's matched with your energy expenditure. And health benefits of physical activity are enormous. In fact, exercise is now considered as a poly pill, improving everything in the body, particularly the muscle function, the bone function, the cardiac function, glucose homeostasis insulin sensitivity, lipid parameters, increasing the HDL and decreasing the LDL ratio is being altered. Even the autonomic function is supposed to be better. One in four adults do not meet global recommended levels of physical activity and risk of morbidity and mortality because therefore it increases by 20, uh, 20 to 30%. Here is a study by Anjana et al. from uh, Medas Diabetes Research Foundation. And you can see here the physical activity pattern in terms of meds they have given. There are more inactive people than active people and highly active, of course, as uh, I mean, it's common, they have very small proportion are highly active. And subject who, at, who do at least 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous intensity activity, leisure time, physical active, a very small percentage, whether it's overall, or rural or urban. And if you look at the age-wise distribution above 60, uh, no recreational activity has been noted in elderly population. This is something which we need to worry. So the lifestyles, if you look at, so the way we are born, the way we grow up, the food we eat, the fluids we drink, the way we live, the way we play, everything counts. ICMR N9 recommends for sedentary adults 20 minutes, 20 minutes of moderate to vigor, vigorous physical activity per day to increase the PAL to 1.43 and 30 minutes to increase the PAL to 1.5. Or at least more standing, walking, moving for one to two hours a day plus 20 minutes of uh, MVPA per day. That is a moderate to vigorous physical activity. This is for a sedentary individual, elderly, I, I presume are uh, uh, sedentary, except for a few of them. I have looked at the guidelines. I've just tried to summarize here. Elderly should move more and sit less. And two to three days a week, they should do some muscle strengthening exercises for better fitness, strength, balance, and flexibility. This is the overall uh, summary of the various guidelines. We, have, we do not have any separate guidelines for, uh, separately for the elderly. So the dietary goals and guidelines for elderly, we have recently modified it. The, the third volume is going to come soon. Uh, this is uh, other day we had been discussing this. I have to put the goals and the guidelines here. Maintain the health of the elderly and increase the life expectancy. And um, uh, include nutrient-rich foods. The guideline is to increase the nutrient-rich foods in the diets of the elderly for health benefits. And to remain healthy, and active senior citizens need foods rich in vitamins, minerals, along with adequate physical activity. We have made it as simple as possible. And healthy food habits and regular comfortable level of physical activity are required to improve the quality of life. Now, this is the my plate for the day has been uh, suggested uh, during the centenary year of the Institute for a 2000 kilocalorie diet. Uh, now the uh, it's almost half the plate consisting of 500 grams of vegetables and fruits and one fourth the plates of uh, cereals, including nutri cereals, uh, nothing but uh, millets. And then, of course, we have pulses, nuts and seeds, fats and soil being presented. And uh, this is on the website of NIN. Anybody can download it and uh, modify it according to whatever they, they wish to prescribe for a different age group. Now, what is the way forward? Policies are one way to see that elderly are more comfortable. The national policies for welfare of senior citizens, there has been one uh, national policy for old people in 1999. The objectives are he here. It's, I, I don't think I, I'll have time to go through everything. 
but families to take care of their uh, older family members it's a must and uh, there are laws to protect uh, protect if uh, people do not uh, take care of the elderly voluntary and non governmental organization to supplement the care provided by the family an adequate healthcare facility should be there of course research and training facilities will improve their lives much better and create awareness to help elderly lead productive and independent life they have now national plans of action as well with other ministries now the way forward for healthy aging is enabling environment to empower the society actually we need to have um, holistic and multi dimensional inputs the first thing is we need more databases longitudinal in nature and dietary intake and nutritional status burden of diseases to under and over nutrition morbidity mortality statistics government and a focus on economic insecurity is important there are some uh, pensions being given by both by the state and the center for the, you need to satisfy certain conditions government and non governmental or civil society groups can work together and leverage the uh, csir funds towards that create government and private sector aided senior citizen homes all senior citizen homes are private except for a few of them which are not up to the standard it should be the, the condition needs to be improved very much here assisted living in old age community set up and of course emphasis on food and nutrition security is very important i am not talked about nutritional supplement and medical nutrition therapy it's a subject by itself but as far as possible it's better to get everything that is required from a diversified diet that's the reason i have not touched on it very much and create dedicated health structures for senior citizens establish day care center establish and community physical activity and physiotherapy centers mobile palliative care units can help a lot create hospices also for pa palliative care for those who are terminally ill to provide compassionate care for a variety of needs and you can unmet needs for hearing aids wheelchairs electronic ex equipment etc can be looked at monitoring system has to be established care and access to health care are to be viewed as actually as fundamental rights for the elderly are there any sustainable solutions for elderly um, only policy issues can require a lack of formal and regular mechanisms to strengthen the existing policies should be there and then policy and program audit is essential supportive environment advocacy is important promoting better intergenerational bonding with a focus on reciprocity is important safety and security of older persons through proper laws is also very important and capacity development is, uh, is very important particularly the mid level managers at state and local governance health professionals uh, um, one of the most important things is training for the geriatric caregivers this is a must because now there are many organizations trying to provide geriatric caregivers without a proper training so this should be looked into and of course the csr funds can be leveraged I just wanted to show you the smart technologies. I hope I'm not exceeding the time. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Inter interactive devices to promote functional independence of the elderly is essential to improve mobility, dexterity, increase memory and cognition, and decrease social isolation. I'm not been dealing with cognition because there is a separate um, lecture on it. The solutions for improving. Uh, uh, technology of course tv entertainment is one one may if you look at the list of the things which i have suggested here one may think that it may promote more physical inactivity but that's where people should use this and there should be a proper trade off between physical activity and usage of all these equipment but this will make the life more comfortable for the elderly whether it's tablets or smartphones reminders you can set up uh, you can track your medication consultations and investigations can be accessed and there is a natural language processing system you don't even have to type anything tracking for active lifestyle wearable gadgets will motivate the elders to do more exercise emergency response system for medical aid it's, it's these are all very useful things but as i said it should not promote physical inactivity 
So concluding, I'll say aging is a vital demographic truth. I've tried to cover as much as possible. Healthy, diversified, nutrient-dense diet and physical activity can delay aging. And the government and private sectors or civil societies need to collaborate. And policies and programs need assessment and adaptation and holistic multidimensional inputs are needed to promote healthy aging and quality of life. Thank you very much for your patient uh, hearing. Thanks a lot. For age is strictly a case of mind over matter. If you don't mind it, it doesn't matter. Thank you. Excellent deliberation, ma'am. I must say that no, you have really proved what is meant by putting you whole lot of information in a nutshell. It was indeed a great deliberation, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. And you have really rightly touched upon the various aspects, starting with you know, the prevalence of chronic illnesses from the most recent data. And it is so alarming to see that even the rural population is showing higher prevalence of macro and micronutrient deficiencies, probably due to the lifestyle changes. Having come from a rural India, I know how the life has changed over there. And no wonder the tribal population is having lower incidence of chronic illnesses. So you have rightly emphasized the role of exercise uh, for healthy aging. And while explaining the various benefits, you, know, you have made it so simple and sounded so simple, but each and every movement as you age is actually so beneficial to the body. You have touched upon each and every important aspect that will facilitate healthy aging in the population. And somehow, as you said, aging population is a section of population that has been often ignored, I think. And the attention is more and more focused on the youngsters, the children, pregnant and lactating women, uh, definitely we have to give due focus to those, those groups of population, but we cannot ignore aging population because today we are boasting so much greatly about the youth of India, but very soon all these youngsters are going to get into the next stage of life. So for that, um, uh, introducing healthy lifestyle practices is so very important so that we will see a better, healthier India, even with 50 plus population uh, in our country. And uh, you have given a very right app message to everybody. And the way forward is very, very interesting. That has really emphasized the role of all of us, all stakeholders in looking after the aging population and facilitating healthy aging. Thank you so very much, ma'am. And we are highly thankful to you for accepting our invitation. And in spite of so many hardships, that you had to face, like you not know, to be here with us today. Uh, uh, I, your I, I should be thanking you for giving me this opportunity. I hope uh, people have uh, enjoyed the presentation or liked it at least. It can, it can, it can only serve as a stimulus for many of the people that yes. who are participating in. Yes, ma'am. Definitely, definitely. And I really hope with your position in the committee, you will definitely push it forward. Um, the committees, ICMR especially, towards uh, bringing out the recommended dietary elements for the elderly uh, so that we look forward for another publication from your team towards the same. I'm very happy that you now we have our former president, Dr. Sashikaran, also with us on this um, uh, in the audience. And I'm very happy. Thank you very much, sir, for supporting us. And uh, your presence here means a lot for us. And I'm also thankful to Dr. Yadav from Akkamani um, for supporting us and encouraging us in our endeavors. Thank you so much. And uh, I now uh, hand over the platform to Dr. Lakshmi Meenan to take it ahead. Thank you, Dr. Shubhadra. With the keynote address capturing the essence of today's webinar, we will now proceed to the much awaited technical sessions which will be delivered by eminent speakers. I invite Ms. Chandni Chopra, a PhD scholar, a very active life member of the NSI Mumbai chapter and its social media team to introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Tatiana Rops. It also gives me a great pleasure to invite Mrs. Vinaya Vaishampayan, head Department of Food Science and Nutrition, Dr. BMN College of Home Science, a seasoned educator of young minds to moderate the session. Over to you, Ms. Chandni and Mrs. Vinaya. Thank you so much, Dr. Lakshmi Menon. Uh, just allow me a minute. I'll share my screen.
I hope the slides are visible. Yes, yes, yes. Is. So uh, it's a great privilege to introduce with all the participants the speaker of our first technical session, and uh, that is Dr. Tatiana Rocks. We've had Dr. Rocks with us uh, previously as well, and I'm very excited to introduce all the participants to our speaker once again. Dr. Tatiana Rocks is a postdoctoral research fellow and head of translational and educational stream at the Food and Mood Center Impact at the Deakin University, Australia. She completed a PhD from the University of the Sunshine Coast and Dr. Rox is extensively involved in education and training of professionals and community nutritional psychiatry and is regularly invited to speak at various academic and professional events. She's also an accredited practicing dietitian and leads several research projects exploring the relationship between diet and mental and gut health. And she has uh, carried on various investigations in individuals with eating and post-traumatic stress disorders. Currently, Dr. Rox is leading an internationally recognized free online course, which is called the Food and Mood, Improving Mental Health Through Diet and Nutrition, which has more than 69,000 enrollees globally. So uh, with that, I now request Dr. Tatiana Rocks to take over the session. And today she will be talking about aging, nutrition, and mental health. Welcome, Dr. Rocks. I request you to take over the proceedings. Hello, everyone, and thank you for such a wonderful introduction, Chadney. I hope everyone can hear and see me and see my slides. Is that correct? Yes, Dr. Rox, we can see your slides. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I would like to thank our organizers of this beautiful event for the invitation to present in the company of such a prominent researchers, educators, and leaders in nutrition. I'm absolutely delighted to speak to you today about diet and mental health in aging. So today I'm coming to you as Chadney presented me from the Food and Mood Center, which is part of the Impact Institute, Deakin University, Australia. So at the Food, center, food and Mood Center, we focus on nutritional psychiatry that area of research and practice which link diet to mental and cognitive health outcomes. Our center is very unique in nutritional psychiatry focus, and we support absolutely critical importance of diet in psychiatry. The concept of nutritional psychiatry was established in 2015 by a group of researchers and practitioners which were led by Professor Felice Jaka, who also is a director of our center. The Food and Mood Center have a few pillars of research and translation which are related to human mental health across the life stages. We start with earlier life and to even before um, actually birth of the child, as um, Dr. Krishna Swami rightly pointed out, that nutrition starts before we're born. So, and we study nutrition and the links to mental health in pregnancy, and then all throughout life, including cognitive decline and neurodegeneration. So today, I'm going to be talking about mental health in older age. I talk about several impactful factors, for example, inflammatory, uh, inflammatory processes, brain plasticities and BDNF, gut microbiome. All these factors are linked to nutrition, but also all of these are linked to mental health. I touch on some interventions such as diet, use of psychobiotics and use of FMT or fecal mass transplant. So, and it's a very important conversation to have. We heard already from other speakers that our world population is aging. Soon we're gonna have more older people than younger people. 
So it's very important to age well. When it's come to mental health, we all struggle in. And at older age, around 15% of older adults suffer from a mental health disorder and most elderly experience depressive disorders. So what is depression in elderly? Depression in elderly and poor mental health in elderly impacts their many abilities. For example, physical activity, it worsens outcomes of medical diseases. We see people with poor mental health usually have poor medical or physiological outcomes as well. So it increases morbidity and mortality. It increases the risk for late life, late life suicide as well. And yet often poor mental health and depression in the elderly is not recognized or treated. You hear talks about, oh, she's just a shy older lady, or he just a grumpy older gentleman. So sometimes our changes in mood, uh, people put that down to age and not to changes um, in our mental health. Our mental health dependent on many factors and causes of poor mental health are usually quite complex. However, some of these causes could be managed and targeted by health professionals. For example, we understand that chronic medical conditions impact our mental health outcomes. Diet and nutrition, the research shows us again and again that in general, people with better quality of um, diet and better nutritional status have a lower prevalence of mood disorders and a lower risk for developing mood disorders such as depression. Malnutrition, impacts our mental health as well. Polypharmacy or use of many different um, medications often not well supported or managed by doctors or health professionals. Late life stresses and losses, functional decline, physical and cognitive, Lack of social interaction, particularly in the Western countries, a lot of elderly live alone. I know that Dr. Krishna Swami mentioned that in India, about 5% of elderly lives alone. This number is generally much greater in Western countries. And that impacts how people feel and impacts their mental health. And of course, substance misuse. So it's quite prevalent in all the population as well. So aging is associated with decline in physiological functions and adaptive cognitive capacity. These are inevitable results of molecular and cellular human um, damages, cellular damages, which we as humans experience during um, our life. However, there are several biological pathways that are associated with mental health and could be targeted through dietary therapies. Today, I'll touch on inflammation, brain plasticity, and neuro neurogenesis, sorry, and gut microbiota. So let's look at inflammation. Evidence shows us that mental health issues might be linked to immune system and inflammation. Inflammation is that chronic activation of the body's immune system. Chronic inflammation increases our risk for developing depression and contributes to neurodegeneration. Factors that are linked to inflammation are multiple and varied. Critically, if you look at them closely, most of them are modifiable in medical, uh, with medical help. For example, level of stress, lack of vitamin D, poor sleep, physical inactivity, obesity, substance misuse, poor dental health, atopy or tendency to develop allergies can all contribute to inflammation and progression of neurodegeneration we see in older people almost all of this could be improved. 
Unfortunately, even healthy Asian, age, aging sorry, is associated with increased inflammation and deterioration of multiple body systems, which can lead to a number of issues, including mental health. But research shows that diet and nutrition modulate our immune system and might alter neuroinflammatory processes that contribute to poor mental health outcomes, such as depression. One of the examples of the diet that was devised specifically for older people to support their cognitive and mental health is the MIND diet. So the MIND diet is a combination of Mediterranean diet and DASH diet. So DASH diet is dietary approach to stop hypertension. So the MIND diet is based on high consumption of vegetables, berries, nuts, plant oils, whole grains, beans, fish, poultry, and eggs. And it's very low on salt, animal fats, and ultra-processed foods with high, with high amount of added salt, fat, and sugar. The MIND diet was tested in several studies and overall shows very promising capacity to slow decline in cognition and mental health, poor mental health outcomes with age. The foods which are core of the MIND diet, such as plant-based foods, veggies, beans, nuts, plant oils, and fish are rich in dietary components that show to protect the brain through their antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. For example, vitamin E. These are also potentially in inhibit this beta amyloid deposition in the brain, which we see in neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. So vitamin E, folate, flavonoids, carotenoids, thought to be protective. These foods, of course, plant foods are very rich in polyphenols that thought to manage neurotoxicity and apoptosis, which we see in cognitive de um, deterioration. Although I'm talking about the mind diet here, it is of course understood and accepted that any diet which is similarly high in antioxidants, polyphenols, and omega-3 fatty acids is potentially anti-inflammatory and therefore neuroprotective. So speaking about neuroprotection, another critical factor that support our mental health is brain plasticity. Brain or neuroplasticity is that ability of the brain to alter its connections, almost like rewire itself. So our brain can change connection and form new neurons, new connections. This ability is important during the brain development and maturation and earlier life in childhood. It's also what supports our brain structure and functions through life. And brain plasticity is also absolutely critical in later life to moderate our cognitive decline. The process of neurogenesis or growth of new neurons, at least partly dependent on protein called brain-derived neurotropic factor or BDNF. BDNF is present in most parts of the brain, but particularly in hippocampus, that area responsible for mood and cognition. And what study shows us that um, people with increased level of stress usually have low levels of BDNF. We also see that people with poor diet also have decreased levels of BDNF and smaller hippocampal volume. For example, in this Australian study, this Australian study was one of the first which linked the concept of brain plasticity and diet health to whole diet. The study was conducted in aging cohort of about 255 people. So the study also measured the brain volume with two magnetic resonance imaging, once at the baseline and another scan was conducted approximately four years later. 
And the study showed that right from baseline, the diet quality was associated with the volume of our brain, the volume of hip, hip, hippocampus. You can see that at baseline, the blue bar, people with a poor diet have a low volume. After four years, people who followed healthy or prudent dietary pattern, which based on whole foods, this following up such as diet was associated with larger hippocampal volume. Isn't that interesting? Another European study, a much larger cohort, the Rotterdam study, um, cohort of nearly um, over 4,000 people. This study showed that our better diet quality is related to larger total brain volume, gray matter, and white matter, as well as hippocampal volume in our brain. In this specific cohort, following guidelines, dietary guidelines, and consuming a lot of vegetables, fruit, whole grains, nuts, and grains was associated with better brain health. Another important mechanism that links our diet with mental and brain health is so-called gut-brain axis. In this relationship, the overall diet quality plays a critical role as well. You'd be surprised if I said it didn't. Gut-brain axis is, of course, that bidirectional communication between our brain and our gut. This communication occurs through various pathways, including the vagus nerve, the immune system, neuroendocrine pathways, and bacteria-derived metabolites, which of course are products of metabolism. Dysregulation in this gut microbiota, gut-brain axis, has been linked to a number of mental health disorders, including stress, depression, anxiety, and neurodegenerative disorders, such as Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Let's have a closer look at um, gut microbiota in the elderly. So gastrointestinal system overall changes with age on both the organ and cellular level. And this potentially impacts other body systems and functions. We see that gut microbiota composition changes and impact of age-related changes in the function of our gastrointestinal system on nutrient digestion and absorption, as well on all other intestinal microbiota functionality is largely still unknown. What we understand that gut microbiota changes in all the people, and these changes are more likely due to declining health, medication use, changes in lifestyle factors, diet, and not linked to chronological age in itself. Research shows that although the factors which might impact gut microbiota of the humans are similar, changes in gut microbiota are associated with host specific factors such as genetic lifestyle, for example, um, different diets, smoking, exercise, social demographic factors such as socioeconomic status and ethnic background, living situation, because we see that a community dwelling adults or older people have a quite a different gut microbiota to those who spend a lot of time in hospitals or homes and different comorbidities as well as medication use. From the perspective of diet and nutrition, Closer look shows us how aging is actually associated with decline in gastrointestinal health. Our gastrointestinal tract is of course have a core function for the body and is responsible for adequate digestion and absorption of nutrients. However, with age, we see many of these functions of gastrointestinal um, tract deteriorate. Even our brain becomes less switched on. For example, all the people quite often report reduced or very little appetite and feeling fullness after very small amounts of food. 
This is why in particular for the elderly, we really, who don't consume much of food, every mouthful should be full of energy and nutrients. But often it's quite um, challenging to convince all the people to eat as basic functions of the mouth, such as chewing or swallowing are sometimes quite impaired. All the people often have dental issues and reduce saliva secretion. This is often due to medication, which make chewing and swallowing quite challenging. Peristalsis or the movement of food from our mouth to our stomach is also often um, impaired. What is interesting that many other function of functions of gastrointestinal um, tract in healthy elderly people remains relatively stable with aging. For example, gastric acid, gastric emptying of solids in the stomach, but overall, gastric complaints and regularity, stools, colon and um, colon transit time do change in all the people, impacting gastrointestinal ability to digest and absorb nutrients. We also see that on a cellular level, aging is associated with irregularities in CCK secretion and sensitivity. CCK is of course that peptide hormone in gastrointestinal system, which is responsible for stimulating the digestion of fat and protein. Production of other enzymes that are essential for digestion, such as pepsin, chymotrypsin, lipase, amylase, production of these enzymes decreases with age. Intestinal barrier function remain relatively stable in the healthier um, elderly people. However, we see that um, elderly usually have higher levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines and decrease defense activity of um, phag phagocytic sorry, cells. These, of course, um, cells are natural killers, which um, hand out the pathogen in our gastrointestinal systems. And that's probably why we see um, the increased risk of prolonged infections in the elderly. When it's come to gut microbiota, the evidence is yet to paint a uniform picture for the elderly people. Comparison study shows conflicting outcomes. We understand that gut microbiota is changing, but exactly how, it's not always clear. We see that differences in composition are more pronounced in frail elderly and those with multiple comorbidities. More general, several studies show that age-related um, changes in gut microbiota presented through decrease in abundance of um, so-called beneficial bifidobacterium and lactobacilli. There are various nutritional interventions that aim to modulate um, intestinal microbiota composition and its function. And this might improve age-associated decline of the system and impact overall health. I'll briefly talk about dietary changes, psychobiotics, and touch on fecal microbiota transplant or FMT research. First, let's have a look at diet. One example is that large study that analyzed gut microbiota from over six, uh, 600 older people from uh, European countries. Before and after these people followed Mediterranean diet. The results showed that following Mediterranean diet positively impacted gut microbiota, which was associated with slow inflammation and frailty, and also improved cognitive function. Adherence to Mediterranean diet also led to increased abundance of microbial taxa that were negatively associated with inflammatory markers. So quite promising results, but of course, much more research is needed to confirm the mechanisms and to see 
see if the results from such a study uh, could be universally applied. Speaking about promising areas of research, I thought I'd talk very briefly about psychobiotics. So psychobiotics are a group of dietary foods and supplements with potential to affect the central nervous system related functions and behaviors mediated by the gut brain axis. These substances impact not only human gastrointestinal system, but have a potential to impact mental health. Psychobiotic include, psychobiotics include probiotics, prebiotics, symbiotics, parabiotics, postbiotics, and fermented food. In the past five years, some psychobiotics were reported to decrease inflammation, decrease cortisol level, and improve symptoms of anxiety and depression. Psychobiotics could also be effective in improving neurodegenerative disorders such as Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Use of psychobiotics can improve GI function and positively impact immunity. However, the evidence for the effect of psychobiotics on mental and neurological conditions and disorders remain quite limited. One of the better research group of psychobiotics are probiotics. For example, this study of over 60 elderly participants taking bifidobacterium for 12 weeks showed that this practice improved mental flexibility, stress, and BDNF level. So quite a small study, but well run with the good results. But overall, the outcomes are quite mixed. This, for example, systematic review of 17 randomized controlled trials showed that although probiotics modify gut microbiota in and improve immune functions, they impact on mental health outcomes are still quite inconclusive. One of the very last possible modifications of gut microbiota I would like to very quickly talk today about is of course gut microbiota transplant. This highly novel approach shows that gut microbiome can be used to reverse age-related brain deterioration and improve mental health outcomes. Studies like this, of course, only done in mice, in animals, but they show that moving or transplanting gut microbiota from younger mice to older mice is actually reversed age-related differences in immunity and hippocampal um, volume as well. Isn't that quite interesting? So the future of aging probably promising, but we need much more research to uh, say for sure. So in a brief summary, mental health in all the people and in any age is linked to diet and nutrition. Healthy diet are diets which are based on whole plant foods and low in ultra processed foods. These diets can improve inflammatory processes, brain plasticity and gut microbiota and lead to hopefully better mental health. I would like to acknowledge my team at the Food and Mood Center and collaborators and also mentioned that although I'm very happy with invitation, I will not be accepting any speaker's fee today from um, Kellogg's India, but I appreciate the invite. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rox. I think you filled our minds with ideas mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sure the participants have a lot of questions and they are uh, really wanting to ask you a few. I think we'll take some here now. I think I have one from my own side. You spoke about uh, specific, specific nutrients which are important for mental health. It need not only be the geriatric population, but generally and specifically the geriatrics. I'm talking mm -hmm. of omega-3 fatty acids. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about uh, omega-3 fatty acid content in food sources and how in effect, if mm -hmm. there is any effect on mental health. Mm -hmm. So omega-3 fatty, it's a fantastic question. Thank you, Dr. Binet. It's a very interesting question. So omega-3 fatty acids, and I'm sure that Dr. Krishna Swami 
um, mentioned some different fatty acids. She talked about omega-3 fatty acids and monosaturated uh, fatty acids, which are all important and mental health. So good sources of specifically of omega-3 fatty acids are of course fatty fish, but a lot of other nuts and seeds and plant oils have a lot of omega-3 fatty acids. There's a lot of promising research around omega-3 fatty acids, but we also need to remember that uh, sometimes research is done in European populations. So its applicability to say Indian population is unknown, to me at least. I hope it answers your question. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Shashi Karan is here and I think uh, he's raised his hand. So uh, sir, can you please go ahead and ask thank your you. question? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rox. That was a great presentation. Uh, I have one question that how does mental stimulation, you know, involve in, in addition to all these to keep the mental function from getting deteriorated? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. Thank you for asking. And that's, of course, something when I was talking about many factors which impact our mental health. I couldn't cover all of them, but we understand that mental stimulation is very important as well. It's important for elderly people to keep challenging themselves, to learn new, uh, new things, to talk to other people. That's why we're saying that social connection is so good for mental health because we constantly, when we talk to other people, we exchange information, we exchange skills and knowledge, and that supports, of course, our mental health. So great question. And of course, cognitive stimulation being shown to have a better outcomes for our mental health. Actually, thank you, ma'am. I was actually going to ask you the same thing, uh, especially because there are a lot of researches which are coming up over, over uh, showing benefits of social health and uh, rela its relation to mental health and obviously then affecting food intake. So thank you for your response. I think I have one more interesting question here for you. It says it's always challenging to convince elderly people to change food patterns and introduce food which they think is not suitable for them. It's a period of time that, has, that they have been eating a specific food. So mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you think you can actually handle this in order to convince them to take good diets which are important for good mental health? Mm -hmm. It's very much depend on each individual and what I found on their values. For example, you can talk about better impact of diet or foods you asking them to eat on say their mental health, their clarity of their mind, their ability to talk and remember where they left house keys and stuff like this. So link that to their immediate uh, needs. You can talk about that how sometimes changing diet takes time. So we need to use very small and sustainable steps to do it. So keep trying, include elderly in eating with younger people. We see unfortunately that we're losing skills and knowledge around food because all the people don't eat with younger people. So if you can, in, 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 yeah, yes, include different generations together. And then you can talk to your wonderful elderly people and ask them to be a good example for their great grandchildren and children. And usually they do it for somebody else, of course, but not for themselves. True, true that, true that. One more, one more question, uh, very interesting. Can external probiotics improve the gut environment? What do you think? Well, some, some studies do show that yes, they can. I showed you that systematic review. It's a bit of a mixed outcome in general. And again, look, we need to look at the specific study, but in general, we see that in people with higher gut inflammatory indexes, probiotics could potentially be beneficial, but it's very much dependent on probiotic strain, also on the health of participants and what else they got going on there. But look, generally, 
probiotics um, do not bring any harm. But when we talk, when we think about all the people, you know, when we say deliver probiotics as part of say fermented foods, they come also together with the nutrients. So it's very hard to, you know, to overdose, although it's hard to overdose on probiotics, but you sometimes could start eating too much and it will bring some uncomfortable gastrointestinal symptoms. But if you eat, say, probiotics as part of food, then it comes in that nice nutrient dense package as well. So probably answer is yes and no, depends for whom, depends what uh, probiotic as well. Thank you so much. I have something else also very interesting to ask you. You talked about um, new connections that the brain makes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I recently read about it in, in some place where there's a simple practical thing to do. And that is to use, uh, if you're a right hand, you use a left hand of, of mm -hmm. an entire day. Do you think there's any benefit in that? And do really uh, this kind of uh, practical tips that are actually overshared over the media really work? To be completely honest, I don't know because it's not my area of research, but I suppose it will link, uh, you know, it's... Uh, kind of comes under this umbrella of changing and can, can always challenging our cognitive system. So yeah, I, I don't want to write with the left hand, but if you think, um, Dr. Binia, that that's something which will help your mental health, so you go ahead and do it. <laughs> correct, correct. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think uh, there are a lot of questions that are coming in. And uh, I'm just requesting that uh, these questions be mailed to us and we will be sending them to Dr. Ross. And once we receive the reply, we'll mail the questions and the answers back to you. So just to sum up, I think you have very clearly and nicely told us that aging is not an option and we are all going to go there. <laughs> and in effect, actually the day you are born, you start to age. And in the wise words of the Buddha, I would say that to keep the body in good health is, is a duty. Otherwise, we shall not be able to keep our mind strong and clear. And I think uh, what we have to keep do to keep our body strong is to have a good nutritious diet. Dr. Rox, you have actually really linked all these three things together. That is nutrition, aging, and mental health. Thank you so much for this excellent session. And on behalf of the NSI Mumbai chapter, I really, really thank you for this excellent deliverance of your session. It was a brilliant talk. I think what we have to take from this is, and the highest appreciation for the talk would be that when we not just hear your words, but put into practice all that we have learned. So thank you so much for being here today. And we look forward to actually, there are a lot of questions, in fact, in the chat box asking that, uh, are there any specific courses uh, that you are going to put up, just like how we have the food and the mood course. And uh, it would be nice to connect with you and to know about many more courses that you will do. So thank you so Absolutely. much for being here and a lovely start to the scientific session. Thank you very much. Over to Thank you. you. What a feast to the mind. Thank you, Dr. Rox. Thank you, Mrs. Vinaya and Ms. Chandni. Um, as we await the second session, I request Ms. Fareen Khan, practicing nutritionist and a vibrant member of the NSI Mumbai chapter, to kindly introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kathy Greaves. And to join her, I'm pleased to invite Mrs. Madhavi Sate, Head of Department, Nutrition and Meal Management at Srimati MMP Shah College of Arts and Commerce, Mumbai, an active LEC Life member of the NSI chapter to kindly moderate the session. Over to you, Ms. Farheen and Ms. Madhavi. Thank you so much, Dr. Lakshmi. It's a very interesting session which is going on. And to add to it, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our very next speaker from the other corner of the world, Dr. Catherine Greaves. Just a moment. Dr. Catherine Graves, she is a PhD, a principal nutrition scientist research and development and innovation Kellogg's Global Growth Team, USA. She teaches, she's a PhD in nutritional sciences, 1996, the University of Arizona, 
Dr. Graves has served as technical lead for strength and energy platform and global case and global special gay brand and now serving as technical lead for plant-based protein platform. She serves as authoritative internal and external expert with recognized leadership in the technical areas of strength, fitness and energy, satiety and energy balance. She teaches undergraduate and graduate level courses in nutrient metabolism and research methods. Dr. Graves has been awarded grant fund fundings from various institutes. She has authored chapters in various biology and chemistry books. She has numerous journal and abstract publications under her name. Uh, a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Graves. We are really looking forward to your session today. Over to you, Dr. Graves. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'd like to make sure that you can hear me and also I will share. So can you both hear me and see my screen? Yes, ma'am, it's perfect. Very good, thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak with you today on such a renowned panel. It is my honor to contribute the information I have on protein and aging. And what I'll speak to you about today is optimizing dietary protein intake with healthy aging. So um, I can uh, basically give you all the information that I'll have in these slides today in one sentence. And that is to consume adequate amounts of high quality protein at every meal combined with physical activity. Now I could stop talking right now, but what I'll do is continue and give you a lot more information around adequate, what adequate means, what high quality means, and then at every meal. So I wanna start very basic, and I know this may be basic for most of you, uh, but I wanna make sure that we're all on the same uh, playing field when it comes to talking about dietary protein. So very simply, what is protein? Protein is made up of 20 amino acid building blocks linked together different structures. The primary structure is just that string of amino acids. Secondary structure are the kinks and folds that happen within that chain. And then the tertiary structure is when it's folded into its 3D conformation. And that's what makes the distinct structural and fun functional regions. Now the quaternary structure is when you have a number of these single proteins blended together along with non-protein molecules like vitamins, minerals, carbohydrates, and fats. Now the amino acid sequence really determines the structure and function of proteins. So taking any one of those amino acids in the series that you have here and moving them around or replacing them completely changes the structure and the function of the protein. Now, what is dietary protein? Dietary proteins can be found in meat, milk, and eggs, animal sources, as well as plant sources like nuts and seeds, grains, and beans. Dietary protein is one of the most important nutrients in our foods. They deliver on essential and non-essential amino acids to the body. And if you look to the right-hand side here, you can see that I've listed the essential, the conditionally non-essential and the non-essential amino acids that are strung together in proteins and delivered to the body. What's most important from food are the essential amino acids because these other two category of amino acids can be made within the body. Food has to deliver these essential amino acids to us. The other thing that protein, dietary protein provides to us is a significant source of nitrogen in which we cannot make our DNA or an RNA without. Protein 
can sometimes replace fat and carbohydrate in terms of an energy source, but fat and carbohydrate cannot replace our body's need for protein. The other thing that I want you to remember throughout this presentation is that dietary protein must be eaten balanced throughout the day as it isn't stored in our bodies. Many of us believe that muscle is a storage site for, for protein and for amino acids, but actually it's very similar to calcium and bone. We don't store um, calcium in bones or amino acids in our muscle in order to use it when we need it um, to be available to us. But those, whether it's bone or whether it's muscle, serve very important um, functions for us just in terms of maintaining our structure and allowing us to be mobile through the day. So we cannot be stealing calcium from our bones just as we cannot be stealing amino acids from our muscle. And we do have to maintain blood amino acid levels throughout the day at minimal, at minimal levels. And so we need to make sure we have a constant supply of amino acids, particularly the essential, the essential amino acids coming into our body. So I just wanna make sure, do you see this, um, this box on the top of the screen? Or is it just me that sees that? I'm hoping you can't see it because it does block some of the, some of the text. So the next question, how do dietary proteins become proteins in our body? Again, very simply, we eat dietary proteins. They are broken down. The digestion of dietary proteins start in the stomach and then continue in the small intestines. And those amino acids are, are absorbed into our body in the small intestines. They go from the intestinal tract into the blood and then are sent to different tissues where as amino acids, they are then put back together to build tissue, to build cells, as well as to build our muscle. So what body components are made of protein? Protein makes up 20% of our body mass. Proteins play critical roles in the structure and functioning of our cells, every single cell in our body. So we're very familiar with protein and amino acid being in our muscles, in our hair and nails, even as cellular messages. But we also need to remember that hemoglobin is a protein, that the um, brain signaling, the ion channel proteins are, necessarily, are necessary to get messaging from the brain to a different parts of our bodies through our nerves. Enzymes and hormones are proteins. We have cellular construction workers that are needed to make and remodel our cells. Those are all proteins. Antibodies, immune factors, all proteins. So our body really cannot function without the, without the presence of protein in each and every cell. So what are some of the benefits that we see with consumption of higher levels of protein? Satiety, that's been mentioned before. It helps to keep us full. It helps to fill us up during a meal. Muscle growth and maintenance, especially when combined with exercise. Bone structure. We know that the backbone, so to speak, of bone is protein and then carbohydrates and minerals such as calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium are attached to that protein backbone. But without protein, without amino acids, we don't have the essential uh, components to make our bones. Weight management and improved body composition recovery from exercise and injury, and lastly, glucose control after a meal and throughout the day. And there's more emerging information coming um, regarding this, that a higher protein meal, say at breakfast time, helps to regulate glucose after a lunch meal. Um, more to come in this area, but it is a really wonderful um, area of, um, of scientific inquiry coming in the near future. 
So do we have additional protein needs as we age? Yes, we do. First of all, support for recovery from acute and chronic illness, surgery, falls, and fractures. Remember, protein makes up every cell in our body. So if we're sick or if we fall or have surgery, we need additional protein in order to help us to recover, in order to help us to heal. We also need protein and amino acids to maintain a healthy and well-functioning immune system. And we know as we age, our immune system is attacked more than when we're young. And then lastly, we need protein during those critical periods of severe illness, injury, and malnutrition. So then the question comes up, one of the major um, uh, uh, needs for protein and for amino acids is muscle maintenance and muscle growth. So what is sarcopenia? Sarcopenia is a progressive and accelerated loss of muscle mass and function. And if you look to the right-hand side here, you can see a cross-sectional analysis from a CT scan of a thigh muscle from an individual at the age of 25 and then at the age of 63. And you can see a significant loss in muscle mass at 63 compared to 25 years of age. The other thing you see here is a marbling of the muscle. And what that is, is fat infiltration that happens um, as we age and as we use our muscle mass less. Um, so our muscle requires both glucose stored as glycogen in the muscle, as well as fatty acids in order to maintain the energy supply that is needed by our muscle. And what happens is as our muscle shrinks and as we exercise less, we move less, that fat doesn't get used and it starts to get stored within the body and causes this marbling, which causes a significant issue in terms of the functioning of the muscle mass and also the strength of the muscle. The prevalence of sarcopenia increases as we age, and it is much higher among individuals 60 years of age and older, and it ranges from six to 19% of folks over 60 years of age, depending on where around the world we live, as well as whether we live in an urban setting or a rural setting, and how much exercise we get throughout the day. Low protein intake is a predictor of sarcopenia and frailty. And you can see the picture here on the right-hand side of an a younger individual as well as his older counterpart. And you can see the significant loss of muscle mass between those two pictures. So now you remember I mentioned that we need to consume adequate amounts of high quality protein. So what is high quality protein? And I have two definitions here. The first is a complete protein. A complete protein is a dietary protein that contains all nine of the essential amino acids at levels required by the human body. And you can see in the chart here on the right-hand side, the essential amino acids listed, and then the needs of a two to five-year-old child a school-aged child and an adult. And you can see across the um, age spectrum, the differences in terms of the amount of these essential amino acids that are needed as we age. And the reason for that is the two to five-year-old child and the school-aged child need a lot of protein. They need a lot of those amino acids because they're growing at exponential rates. They're growing in terms of their body, their bone, their muscles as well as their immune system and their, um, their neural system, their cognitive system. So these essential amino acids are required in, in order to enable that growth at the rapid pace that's happening. Now, as we grow into adulthood, we're no longer growing or we shouldn't be growing and we need to maintain our, our body um, cells, our body mass, as well as our immune system and, and the like. So we still have requirements for essential amino acids. They're just not as high as those for younger kids. So um, 
the complete protein is measured by the amino acid score. And the amino acid score you can see here is related to the age of the individual. Now, a high quality protein is different from a complete protein. A high quality protein takes into consideration the amino acid score, but also adds into it the digestibility of the protein. So it's measured using a score called PDCAS or protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. So we take that amino acid score that, that makes a complete protein and we multiply it by the digestibility coefficient of that protein. Now, there are only a couple of regions in the world that take into consideration either that the protein is complete or that the protein is high quality. Three of those regions are um, the US and the FDA, Health Canada, as well as Mercosur countries, which in include Brazil. And you can see here, Mercosur just takes into consideration the amino acid score. So it only takes into consideration whether the protein is complete or not when it looks at making protein content claims and, 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 and claims around protein in food. On the other hand, Canada and the US take into consideration whether the protein is a high quality protein or not. So this again takes into consideration the fact that it is a complete protein and that is highly digestible. So we make sure that those amino acids are absorbed into the body and are available for the body to use. So we must remember that a complete protein is not necessarily a high quality protein. Now, if we look at some examples of high quality proteins, you can see here with the asterisks that these um, proteins are considered to be complete proteins on the left-hand side. You'll also notice that five of these proteins are actual animal-based protein. And that sixth protein that is considered to be a complete protein is soy. Soy is one of the few plant-based proteins that are considered to be not just complete, but also high quality, which is seen here by the, um, by the PDCAS score of one. Most other plant-based amino or plant-based proteins, I'm sorry, are not considered to be complete protein and are not high quality proteins because they have a lower, they are limiting in one or more of the amino acids in the protein and because they're not as highly digestible as say um, uh, animal proteins are. So why is protein more important to us as we age? There are three very specific regions. The first has been mentioned before is we have an inadequate intake of protein as we age. Because food isn't as um, delicious to us, because we start to get fuller more quickly as we eat, we eat not just less protein, but also less calories. Secondly, we have a reduced ability to use the available protein that does enter our body for reasons such as insulin resistance, anabolic resistance, high um, liver extraction of the amino acids, as well as immobility. We just don't use the amino acids and the protein as efficiently as we could. And lastly, we actually have a greater need for protein because of inflammatory diseases, because of oxidative modifications of proteins um, with certain conditions and diseases. We need more protein in order to uh, meet the needs of our body. With inadequate intake, we're not eating enough, we're not using it efficiently enough, and we're needing more for chronic disease conditions. This affects our functioning of our body and we lose muscle, we lose bone, and we lose the efficiency of our immune system. So what are adequate daily protein intake requirements with aging? Now we know what I have set up here is the um, protein intake in a gram basis per kilogram of body weight per day. 
And then other underneath what I did was do the calculations to give you an example of what a 70 kilogram person might need or what an 82 kilogram person might need. And we know that in India, the um, RDA for protein is 46 grams per day for women and 54 grams per day for men. So now the current RDA around the world is approximately 0.2 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. 0 0.8, 0 0.82, it varies depending on which country you're, um, you're speaking of. And that equates to about 55 grams a day for a 70 kilogram person and about 65 grams a day for an 82 kilogram person. Now, as we age, experts are recommending higher levels of protein intake, especially for individuals 65 years of age and older. So you can see here, just to maintain or regain muscle, we're looking at one to 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. And that's a 25 to 50% increase over what we have with the current RDA. In order to support persons with acute and chronic disease, you can see that we're looking at 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. And then to support persons with severe illness, with severe injury or malnutrition, we're looking at 150% increase over the current RDA in order to help to support those individuals. So we see a range of protein intake from the current RDA of uh, 55 grams per day for a 70 kilogram person to almost 140 grams per day for that same person who might be severely ill or malnourished. So how much protein is enough at every meal? I've spoken to you about the importance of dietary protein just in terms of the amount per day. I have a fly <laughs> buzzing around my head. But we also need to look at how we eat that protein throughout the day. Studies show that the relative amount of protein in a meal is important, not just um, the, the amount that we eat on a daily basis. So if you look on the right-hand side here, you can see a graph for older men and a graph for younger men. And what we have is muscle protein synthesis on the y-axis and then protein intake in grams per kilogram of body weight on the x-axis. Now, if we look at a young man first, you can see that per meal occasion, approximately 0.2 to 0.3 grams per kilogram of body weight is the cutoff point where we no longer see an increase in muscle protein synthesis. So we see a maximizing in terms of the benefit that a young man will get from increasing their protein content during a meal. Now, if we look at um, that compared to an older man, you can see that that cutoff, that break point is much higher and is about 0 0.4 grams per kilogram of body weight in an older individual at 70 years, at an average age of 70 years, where there's a, a break point and a leveling off of the benefit to muscle protein syn synthesis. So to maintain skeletal muscle mass and quality with aging, it's very important to eat enough protein during each meal to support the robust stimulation of muscle protein synthesis. And we see that to maximize muscle protein synthesis, there is greater need for protein in that meal in an older person than there is in the younger person. Now, the assumption that we're making here is that maximum muscle protein synthesis response occurs at each successive meal and not just at one meal. And that muscle mass will be maintained with age. Again, another question around how much protein is enough at each meal. First thing we have to do is make sure that we're getting enough protein every day. And then with that, that we divide that protein across the day. Again, remembering that we need to maintain blood amino acid levels throughout the day. 
So we divide that daily protein intake across the three or four meals that we eat. And we're looking at 20 to 35 grams is the recommendation now per meal for individuals as we age, especially if we get past 65 years of age. The other thing that's important is that we get enough leucine, one of the uh, muscle building amino acids in the protein that we consume uh, in, in each of our meals. We also need to take in protein soon after exercise or physical activity in order to help feed our muscle metabolism. And we have to remember that breakfast is a vital meal to fuel muscle and other organ systems because we've just come out of an between an eight and maybe 14 or 15 hour fast since our last meal. So we need to make sure that we get protein in our um, breakfast. And so the recommendation is that we actually receive an even distribution of protein across the day rather than the skewed distribution that's often seen um, with um, meals around the world. So I wanna go back to speaking about leucine um, just a bit. Why do I hear so much about the amino acid leucine? So the reason for this is because leucine is very important in terms of um, maintaining and growing muscle mass. So if we take into consideration that we um, eat protein evenly across the day, and we even get protein before bed at night to help with over overnight recovery, um, we want to make sure that we get enough leucine in that protein. So if you see le blood leucine levels here, and then time across the x axis, you can see a significant increase in leucine and then a drop off over the 300 minutes. Um, this peak right here is very important for two reasons. First of all, it, leucine travels to the pancreas and stimulates insulin release, which then helps to vasodilate our vessels and allow for amino acid delivery to the muscle. The other thing that leucine does is it's the key that or unlocks the door to muscle that then allows those following amino acids, both essential and non-essential, to enter into the muscle to help build muscle, build lean muscle, as well as building strength. Now, the other thing that's very important is exercise because exercise primes the lean muscle system in our body. It causes small tears in our muscles. And what happens is then uh, leucine and the other essential amino acids arrive with immune factors to help to, um, to heal those small micro tears. Many of us, when we exercise too much, we found that our muscles are sore. The reason for that soreness is those micro tears. So leucine and insulin arrive to unlock the door in the muscle. And then those amino acids arrive as building blocks um, to go through that open door and build muscle and strength. So are we getting enough protein as we age? You can see here on the left-hand side that this is a protein intake across the different meals throughout the day in 45 to 59 year olds, 60 to 70 year olds, and 71 year olds. You can see at breakfast, if what we said was you need to get at least 20 grams of protein per meal, you can see at breakfast, it doesn't matter how old we are, we are not getting enough protein. We get enough protein almost at lunch and we get plenty of protein at dinner, not enough during snacking. But the other thing I want you to see here is that as we age, we uh, the protein intake at each of our meals drops off significantly. So we need to make sure that we try to maintain protein intake even with aging and that we maintain that 20 gram threshold at each meal. We also know that about a third of those 50 years and older are not meeting the minimum protein intake requirements of 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. 
So those, as we age again, we are not getting enough protein, even though at younger age groups, we are getting plenty of protein throughout the day. And then lastly, women are more likely to fall short of protein requirements than men. And you can see here percent not meeting protein requirements, women in orange and men in blue, 45% of women not meeting um, the requirements in the 51 to 60 year old. And you can see that increases with age. Are we getting enough protein at breakfast? So the last slide I showed you suggested that in the US at least we were not. So how about if we look around the world? And I'm sorry to say that I don't have data from India, um, but I will continue to look for that data. And if anybody has data available, I would appreciate you sharing that with me. So what this data shows is grams of protein at the breakfast meal, in um, different countries around the world in different age groups. So the blue bars are six years and older um, in through adult and older adulthood. And then it's broken down six to 12 year olds, 13 to 70 year old, 17 year olds, 18 to 54 year olds and 55 plus. And you can see here, here's the threshold that we need to meet. At breakfast around the world, we are not meeting that 20 gram threshold, minimum threshold of getting protein in our foods, in our breakfast occasion. So the question has been brought up, won't higher protein intake be a problem for kidney function? And I wanna say that theories from the early 1900s suggested that higher protein diets would increase blood glucose level as well as impair kidney functions. Both of those theories have been disproven over the years. And we found that no change in blood glucose var with varying levels of protein intake have occurred with protein up to 50 grams per meal. There's also non-existent or trivial effects of high protein on GFR in persons with normal kidney function. And there is no data linking high protein diets to renal function declines in healthy persons or in persons at increased risk for type two diabetes. We also know that if you replace animal proteins with plant proteins, for instance, a vegetarian diet, that is associated with improved renal function in type two diabetes. What are the benefits of um, protein in uh, persons with type two diabetes is that there's preservation of muscle mass, there's weight loss, and there's a lower risk of type two diabetes. But lastly, I do need to caution that guidelines for those with, comp with compromised kidney function are recommended to eat the 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. And again, remember, spread that out across the day. So the last slide I have here is some of the reasons why we're not eating um, as much food and as much protein um, as we age. And the reason for that is, one of the reasons for that is loss of function, whether it be sight or smell or taste or touch or hearing, the loss of function makes food less appealing and makes us less likely to eat. So there are ways to enhance our eating experience that will help in terms of just things like in, in emphasizing visual cues or aromatic um, volatiles or even intense and complex flavors or colors or textures, um, as well as making food easy to open in terms of the packaging. So thank you very much for listening. And I am um, looking forward to questions. Thank you, Dr. Kathy. Uh, for some reason, I'm not able to start my video, but I hope you are able to hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, that was a wonderful, comprehensive synopsis of protein requirements and uh, an overview of the importance of protein, especially during aging. Um, I did find some statistics 
um, about uh, consumption of protein by Indians. And it says that uh, 42 percent of Indians um, uh, consume uh, first class protein, that is fish, chicken or meat weekly. So that is what I found. And this was given by the National Family Health Survey 2015-16. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, basically, how much do they consume in breakfast? I could not find that. Uh, so, ma'am, there is a question. Uh, can you give us a list of foods which are rich in leucine? Yes. So, um, whey protein is, okay. the, is, is a protein that has the highest level of leucine and also leucine that is highly digestible. Other um, plant proteins that are high in leucine include um, corn protein as well as um, sorghum. But we know that from a whole food perspective, um, we have um, sorghum and corn um, as well as canola are, are low in uh, protein level so it's very difficult to get enough leucine from a plant protein source to be able to supply that 2.5 um, to 2.9 um, milligrams per gram of protein. Okay, okay. thank you, ma'am. Uh, there is another question that uh, with aging, the stomach acid declines. So will this affect the digestion of protein? And how do we take care of it? Yes, so stomach acid does um, decline with aging. One of the things that, that we're looking at as a Kellogg company is how we might be able to, um, I'm gonna say pre-digest proteins so that they become more available. So those amino acids become more available. We know that um, uh, plant-based proteins are, um, are, are more difficult to digest as we eat them. And so it really is about looking at how to, um, to, to find proteins in foods that are a little bit better digested. And the other thing again is to remember to get protein across the day. And I, and I can't emphasize that enough. We, most of us either at the lunch meal or the dinner meal eat considerable amounts of protein. So if we can take some of that protein that we normally eat at those larger meals and spread it out throughout the day, that's gonna help us to get um, the protein that we need across the day. And although it won't help in terms of the digestibility, it will help in terms of making sure that we um, continue to have that protein available to us um, as, we, um, as we move through the day. So uh, the bottom line is that we have enough protein throughout the day and distribute this protein equally through our meal. Ma'am, I wanted to ask one question, one more question. Uh, most Indians are vegetarians and meeting protein requirements through a vegetarian diet could be a little difficult. So what would you suggest in such cases? Will any supplements uh, help? Um, so I have, I guess I have two thoughts there. The first thought is that, um, that it's important to combine um, proteins so that you complement the amino acids. Now, I mentioned that you could have a complete protein, um, but most plant-based proteins are not complete. Okay. So when you combine, uh, so in, in meaning that they are limiting in one or more amino acids. So if you combine um, grains, for instance, with legumes, that will complement the amino acid profiles of those two, which then helps to create that complete protein. Um, so that's the first thing that I would, um, that I would suggest. The other thing is, um, again, to make sure that you have protein throughout the day and that um, you make sure that protein is an important part of your meal. So I've mentioned before 20 grams being minimum 
um, in terms of the amount of protein that you get at each meal. So making sure that at breakfast, as well as at dinner, that you're hitting that 20 gram um, level, minimum level of protein. The other thing that I might suggest is to look for higher protein snacks, whether it be nuts or, um, or you know, uh, 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 a combination of say a small uh, mini meal that combines again, both grains with legumes that will help you to get that protein throughout the day as well. Dr. Kamla has a question, I think. No, I just had a comment. Uh, the millet uh, jowar, or what is called a sorghum vulgar, is a rich source of leucine. In addition to that, I feel nuts and seeds are also good sources of leucine, so this can be had to increase the leucine content of the whole protein which we are taking. Uh, I also... Uh, in the recently released uh, nutrient uh, recommendations, the cereal to legume to animal protein like milk has been suggested because milk is uh, consumed by many, though it is an animal protein, even the vegetarians take it. The ratio as three is to one is to 2.5 has been suggested to increase the quality of the protein. So I thought I'll just uh, share with the people who we're asking about the vegetarian protein. Yes, milk is an animal protein, but all of us are used to taking it along with yogurt also. So that should, I think it would to some extent take care of the quality of protein. I don't know, I, it's for Kathy to say something on it. Yes, no, that's perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Krishna Swami. That's, um, that's a, a good, um, roundup in terms of um, allowing for um, dairy protein as well. And I had mentioned that whey protein was a was a, um, a, a protein that's high in leucine and whey protein is found in, in dairy milk. So um, also in terms of, and I'm so sorry about this fly in my room. I keep, you see me uh, waving away the fly. Um, so uh, dairy proteins um, are also found um, to improve, in fact, whey protein is the gold standard um, that most other proteins are compared to when we're looking at improving muscle protein synthesis in the body. Um, so off, whatever the literature might be, you'll find that whey protein is that gold standard, that soy protein, or a blend of proteins might be compared to in terms of showing the benefit to, to uh, muscle protein. Thank you, Dr. Kamla, and thank you, Dr. Kathy. Uh, there are a number of questions, but I think due to the time constraint, uh, we would email the questions to you and uh, we would like you to answer them. Um, on this occasion, I really thank you uh, on behalf of NSI uh, Mumbai chapter, as well as Dr. BMN College of Home Science for taking your time off very early in the morning and to be with us and giving this very, very comprehensive overview of protein intake. I must say, I have to thank uh, Kellogg's as well as Dr. Nadia for, uh, you know, uh, suggesting you as a resource person, very apt resource person for us and taking the National Nutrition Month to an international level. Thank you so much. We Thank really you. enjoyed the I, session. Thank you very much. I appreciate, I appreciate the invitation and I appreciate all of the um, participants who are um, here live today, as well as those who are gonna be listening um, over YouTube in the, ne in the next couple of months. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kathy. So Over on, to Lakshmi now. Thank you, uh, Madhavi ma'am, and uh, thank you for Heen. So armed with this knowledge of protein and aging, let us move on to the third segment technical session of today. I invite Dr. Neha Joshi, who's a consultant, public health nutritionist, founder of Nutri Educare and co-treasurer of NSI Mumbai chapter to introduce our eminent speaker, Dr. Mukund Sabnis to the gathering. 
Uh, with her will be Dr. Veena Yardi, who is the treasurer of the NSI Mumbai chapter and a senior academician and researcher with fruitful years of experience in nutrition. She will moderate the session. So over to you, Dr. Veena and Dr. Neha. Thank you so much, Lakshmi. Uh, it is my honor to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Mupun Savnis. Uh, he is MD in Ayurveda and founder, president and managing director of uh, Jeevan Rekha Ayurveda Chitatsale and Research Center, Aurangabad, Maharashtra. Uh, he is an Ayurvedic physician and principal researcher in Jeevan Rekha Ayurveda Chikitsala and Research Center since 1996, worked extensively on standardization and stability of Ayurvedic medicine, developed a unique management for obesity where more than 48,000 patients have been benefited with this treatment, developed more than 85 centers in India and abroad for treating obesity as disease, having wide experience in Ayurvedic drug formulation and drug development, and have formulated more than 50 formulations which are marketed successfully. Some of the formulations have also undergone double-blind clinical trials. Uh, he is associated with several uh, uh, reputed institutes uh, like uh, BM Kakandari uh, Ayurved Mahavidyalaya, KLE Academy of Higher Education and Research, Bharati Vidyapet University, Irsha, Pune, Sri Jayendra Saraswati Ayurveda College and Hospital, Chennai, and Yoga Vidyadham Nashik. He is a member of steering committee of Interpathy Research, Maharashtra University of Health Sciences, Nashik, and sub-advisory committee, CCRAS, New Delhi. He has published several papers and authored books named Chemistry and Pharmacology of Ayurvedic Medicinal Plants and Concepts of Rasayan. Uh, he has won several awards, the Nantari Award 2007, uh, he is recipient of uh, Vaidya Poratkar Puraskar of Vaidya Khadiwale Ayurved for research in Ayurveda in 2011 and Ayurved Mitra Puraskar from Arobadham Thane 2018. And today he is going to enlighten us on in a very interesting topic that is integration of Ayurveda and holistic nutrition for healthy aging, a transdisciplinary approach. So wasting, without wasting any further time, I quickly hand it over to you, sir, uh, for the uh, session. So, <clears throat> thank you very much for the introduction. I'll just put on my slides. I think you, you, all of you are able to visualize the slides. Yes, sir. Okay. Sarve Sukhinaha Santu, Sarve Santu Niramayaha, Sarve Bhadrani Paschantu Makashit Dukha Bhagavad. So respected dignitaries, respected speakers of this webinar and the people who have organized this web webinar, I really give a big thank to just give me an opportunity to share my thoughts. And the thoughts coming from Ayurveda regarding the holistic nutrition and, and that too for healthy aging. A very, very interesting topic it was given to me. I am really thankful for that. So <clears throat> aging has been described not only in coming 18th, 19th or 20th century, but it has been discussed since thousands of years back. And I can show you certain quotations that they have thought about aging since 2000 years ago. So first of all, I congratulate all of you on the eve of this theme of the 2020 National Nutrition Week and which is feeding smart right from start. So as the previous speaker rightly said that the aging starts from day one of the birth. And when we talk about the nutrition and about the healthy aging, it is never to be taught at the, uh, or never to be expected at the age of 50s or 60s or 70s, but it is to be taught at the age of day one. And that is the correct notion that is feeding smart right from the start. So, Yuge Yuge Dharmapadaha, as we know all Indians that there are certain Yugas that is Satya Yuga, Dwapar Yuga, Treta Yuga and Kali Yuga. 
and for every yug one fourth of the life span is getting decreased so satya yug people used to stay for 400 years then dwapara yug 300 years for treta yug they come to 200 years and in kali yug the life span is up to 100 years and this decrease in life span was attributed to the wrong lifestyle and the wrong dietary patterns the people were following in coming years so definitely nutrition has a very very important role in healthy aging and that has been discussed elsewhere in ayurveda also so ayurveda also thinks about the what we can call as that the one should live for 100 years so they say that the disciplined man who practices wholesome diet lives for a period of 36000 nights that is 100 years is blessed by good people and is free from disease and this can be maintained only by proper food and again they say that aharashya viharashya asyad dosh gunaihi so all the sanskrit quotations i have put forward before you so you can just understand the wisdom our is wisdom through ayurved so diet and lifestyle that are suitable to maintain the normalcy into the humans so that diet and that lifestyle is to be maintained which can have an healthy aging and the proper definition of health that is to be prescribed first do they expect a what we call a homeostasis in all the doshas in digestive fire is a long fire is a wrong wrong term but agni that is similar all the agni dhatus and tissues and all the excretas they should be in the normalcy along with the normalcy of mind soul and the sensory organs so all these if they are in harmony with each other then and then health can be achieved and for healthy aging these should be properly maintained throughout the year uninterruptedly that is very very important so therapeutically that which promotes strength and immunity is categorized as vrishya and rasayan so aging the, there are several chapters in ayurved which has elaborated about a healthy aging and the term that they use is a rasayan while the therapy of the second category is most applied for the alleviation of disorders so rasayan term is used many many times and number of chapters are there which tell about the proper diet and proper healthing in the uh, aging in the body so definitely when we talk about the healthiness so healthiness is about the growth of the tissue proper nourishment of the tissue and proper regeneration of the tissue so growth promotion stabilization and regeneration of the healthy tissue in interruptedly throughout the life makes a person delayed aging or slows the aging of the body so what are the aging signs and symptoms which are common so everybody told about the outer age that is wrinkles decreased brain function sacropenia undernutrition decrease in strength slow motor processing decreased balance low physical activity but we have to think about the inner aging also aging about the smooth muscles aging about the organs aging about the brain all this is to be taught and when we restrict this aging whatever the answer we get with the correct dietary practices correct nutritional practices so by promotive treatment one attains longevity memory intelligence freedom from illness youthfulness excellence of lustre complexion wise optimum strength of physical and sense organ perfection in deliberation respectability and brilliance so this is what we go get out of the rasayan management out of the proper dietary management these are the attributes these are the things what we get about them they have explained it nearly 2000 years back in the terms of dirgham ayu smriti medha arogyam tarunam vaya so that has been mentioned very very correctly so as per ayurved healthy aging is nothing but is a chronological age is to be maintained with a biological age so chronological age is equal to biological age and here i will not talk much about senescence but we know number of senescence activities are there so all these senescence are to be controlled and the major senescence which are to be controlled is a cellular senescence ultimately it is a immuno senescence and the hormonal senescence until and unless we are controlling all these three senescence 
as per the ayurved theory we can't control other senses and these senses are totally controlled with one of the important concept that is the agni concept and agni is nothing but it is a very very proper digestion and proper conversion of food into atp which is attributed towards jatharagni so which has a gut uptake and mitochondrial and er function then proper metabolism may be the cytochrome p450 enzymatic system working on the dhatu agni bhuta agni sorry and the proper acceptance of the tissues that is active receptors and neural sensing all these functions if they are corrected means right from the nutrition we are taking nutrition the body is not able to digest as somebody raised the question about the uh, decrease in the acid when we age so that is that that has already been thought in ayurveda also that when it is aging that is a, there is no proper atp conversion and gut uptake and mitochondrial and er fun, er functions they decline and this is to be maintained very correctly and that's why the prop concept of nutrition is little bit differently put forth into ayurved than the conventional nutrition systems so the intrinsic and extrinsic factors which are responsible for aging are that is telomeres and hormonal hormonal and cellular inflammation and extrinsic factors are sunlight smoking alcohol stress and no doubt no exercise definitely exercise plays a very very other than nutrition exercise plays a very very important role in aging so when we collectively see the theories of aging that genetic and cellular theories dna damage theories error theories or wear and tear accumulation cross linkage free radical all these theories they comprise of one of the main important theory of aging in ayurved that is arm theory so in short arm is a very very big subject but just i have because this may be a new term to the non ayurvedic personalities so arm what is what can be called as arm so it is referred to be an intermediately byproduct of metabolism which have tendency to block the micro channels of different system of the body so this can be compared with the accumulation of lipid fusing maybe amyloid bodies maybe modified proteins and lipids which are not suitable for further metabolism for normal cellular pathway and this is a very very important concept which aggravates aging that's why in even in youth you can see the biological age has been accelerated very badly so this is the process and an outcome of the deviation of main metabolic pathway in the direction to form defective metabolic end product so they have not thought ayurveda has not thought only about the food we are giving but they have also considered the metabolism of the body and that metabolism of the body which creates a defective metabolic end products may get deposited into the cell and can damage the quality of the cell can damage the function of the cell and this can be again compared with the free radical theory is also the electron attack the double bond of the different macromolecules leading to the production of irreversible chemical modification so these things are well elaborated and well explained in in uh, in the science of ayurved so as we have different theories oxidative stress theories or mapks or cell turnover and senescence telomere shortening or nutrient signal signaling so or sorry sensing similarly ayurveda has its own theory of aging which is as viruddha ahar or viruddha ahar, that is incompatible diet and incompatible lights lifestyle maybe obstruction into the micro channels maybe uh, signal uh, transduction and all these things improper agni that is improper metabolism creating arm creating inflammation and creating that is what we call as non nourishment of the tissues leading the person into more or leading the tissues actually to more and more aging process so actually what we identified the two basic factors which has cause of aging is the abundance availability of the food ayurveda has never told to cultivate food that's a very unique thing that agricultural has made abundance into the availability food and industrialization has made abundance into processing so this processing of the food which is more over available to the youngsters or to the older society also that has a major role to create many pathologies at a cellular level at a tissue level which can aggravate aging so again there are three basic causes for metabolic disorders because we work in metabolic disorders and metabolic disorders are basically anabolic disorders which are making more and more aging population so that is accelerated harvesting globalization and conveniency of the food or the convenient food are the three basic factors 
which can make a person more and more aging because we are today sitting in india we want italian food we went we want continental food we want mediterranean food but does the flora of my gut the flora of my intestines the flora of my skin and the flora of the soil does they match with each other that is one of the important thing about the globalization so this aging is moving towards fasting to feasting so there is a change over since last century and majority of the, of the people they are getting prey into metabolic disorders into more and more fisting and then it comes to ayurved that ayurved every time propagates regarding the personalization and the customization of the diet charts and of the meals that's very important there is no unique thing that okay certain substances are good okay they may be good outside the body but how the metabolism of that person is that how is the phenotype of that person it depends on that that particular substance is good or bad for that sample so yoga masam tu yo vidya desh kalupadam purusham purusham viksham sad neyo bishaguttama so for every individual the requirement of the food and the requirement of the drug can it should be different as per the phenotype of that particular person or if you want to go into depth we can go for the metabolic fingerprinting of that person we can go for the uh, uh, cytochrome p450 uh, what we can a picture of that person and then we can decide that this is good and this is bad for his tissues and then we can arrange a diet plan so going for the factors that impose aging through food as per the ayurved is the glycemic index that is excess of carbohydrate consumption there is a glycation effect on the tissues what we have never inquired we never tell the patients that okay sugar is bad for you that exaggerates aging people only have the notion that pe people having diabetics they should have stopped with sugar but all the metabolic disorders and i am i'm just <clears throat> i can tell you that <clears throat> that even diseases like anemia has they have they are covered under anabolic disorders in ayurved so glycemic effect incompatibility of the food that induce cell damage inflammatory food, food that lose a loss of cell homeostasis rancid food that induce free radicals and excess process of food loss of nutrients and development of advanced glycation and protect and rage they all land into ex exaggerated aging and that should be controlled very nicely so they have told about the persons metabolism and digestive faculty is of prime importance while considering the portion size of the food so how much food should be consumed to restrict the aging or to delay aging so one must take food in proper quantity which depends on the strength of the agni considering your metabolism your dose and the portion size of the food should be considered and that shall be known as the proper quantity of food which is digested in due time without disturbing the normalcy so in what time that person is digesting the complete food that is also very important and the food taken in right quantity certainly provide strength complexion happiness and longevity to the person without disturbing the normalcy so then what the question is what is the right quantity as per ayurved what they have told the right quantity always depends on the substance itself based on the food article itself it is advised that heavy articles again digestibility index comes into play they have told the substances which are heavy they have they have told us guru so it is advised that heavy articles should be taken upon one third or one half of the saturation point or capacity of the stomach even light one should not be taken in abundance in order to maintain the strength of the agni so they have given lot of importance to the main metabolism of the individual while advising the food so digestibility of the food and the importance of agni that is metabolism is of prime importance as per ayurved concepts then digestibility of food depends on the food processing even ayurveda has thought about food processing which is the most of the time ignored subject okay we tell you take milk milk is rich with calcium it is having good proteins but what about reheating of the milk reheating of the milk reheating of the honey honey is never advised to heat reheating of the food bakery products creating age through milliard reaction so all even reheating of the milk creating receptors of advanced glycation end products in the milk and in india there is a fashion that every household female they heat the milk twice or thrice in a day that creates more rage receptors are advanced glycation in products creating laxity at a tissue level laxity at a loss of functions of the cells similarly heating of honey is also very not advised so processing of the food is also very important which has been emphasized by ayurved science so what type of food is advised 
so what side type of food is contraindicated so they have told that one should not be habitual to take dried meat now see very important habitual to take dried meat dried vegetable tubers of lotus and stock of lotus as they are heavy to digest one should never eat meat of emaciated animals then other thing what should not be eaten to stop aging one should not be habitual to eat coagulated milk cream cheese pork meat of cow and buffalo fish curd black gram wild barley in a regular fashion when you are in india as ayurveda has been developed in india so when you are residing in india in indian continent these should not be the substances which are to be consumed regularly then what is to be consumed regularly what they have told they have told that one should regularly consume shashtika rice shali rice that is what the varieties of rice hundreds of varieties has been mentioned in ayurved regarding rice and wheat and jowar and all these things then mugda then amalki that is gooseberry then yava that is barley rain water milk ghee and flesh of jungle animals and honey those animals who live in jungles who don't live in marshy places who live in dry areas so flesh of those animal are to be consumed Uh, and that is should be the regular type of food they should have one should follow those in the daily regime which, main, which maintain health as well as prevent onset of diseases so if you follow this dietary regimes and there are lot of papers also we are also working that why they have uh, told about such type of food why they have uh, told that not to use uh, some stocks of uh, what we can call as lotus and uh, why they have not told about the fish why they have not told curds because curds has been in, included into indian thali still ayurveda clearly mentioned that curd should not be used in regular fashion or regular meals as some of the research what we have undergone which with that regular consumption of curds i don't know whether it changes the uh, gut flora it is doubtful but still it increases the high sensitive crp levels so that is to be that that should not be consumed regularly so again they said these food substances that means so those food substances which can create age which can create receptors for advanced glycation end products which can create more inflammatory markers that type of food is an unwholesome food and they say that those food substance that maintain an equilibrium state in body elements and help in eliminating abnormalities of distribution in the path of to equilibrium can be considered as wholesome food other food is not considered as food in ayurveda that's very important so in natural edible substance which destroy the homeostasis of food is not at all food that's a very very important notion so again if you want to maintain the good aging or to be a healthy aging normal and uninterrupted activity of all the three factors throughout the life that is proper atp conversion proper metabolism maintaining the gut flora very correctly maintaining the er function very correctly then proper acceptance of the uh, by the tissues of the uh, nutrients that is active receptors and neural sensing if these functions are uninterruptedly active throughout the life then the person can have a healthy aging that's a very very important and harmony between these type of agnis that is dhatu agni bhuta agni and jathar agni so that there should be a harmony between all these things and if the harmony is maintained definitely we can uh, have an healthy aging so ayurveda again considers food is to human as fuel is to be atom while if a pers- if a car is getting uh, getting driven by petrol we can't put diesel into it similarly what is not advised should not be given to the humans so that's why they said the strength health longevity and vital breath are dependent on the state of state of agni that burns when fed by the fuel of food and drink out vitals when deprived of them so food is human as fuel food fuel is to be atom while that's very very important concept elaborated by ayurved so uh, just i will finish one concept i don't know how much time is remaining so am and agni so these are the malfunctions of agni which can alter oxidative stress which can alter mitochondrial functions which can create low grade inflammation which is very very important in all aging effects 
which can alter gut flora, which can alter the appetite control system that is leptin leptinurin ratios, and which can alter the nutritional status. So all these arm and agni mandya as per Ayurveda theories are to be controlled very perfectly, which can stop aging. And then it comes to the compatibility of the food. So entire diet that excites the doshas but does not eliminate it out of the body that is harmful, and that is what we call as the Virudhana or what we call as you might you might have heard in Indian uh, society that you don't mix milk with fruits or you don't eat this substance with that substance or don't consume curds at night. So there are highly technical reasons behind that, and these technical reasons now at a molecular level we are we are on that platform to identify that why the the old uh, rishis or old scientists have elaborated that type. So the entire drug that excites doshas but does not eliminate it out of the body is harmful. So what is that which does not eliminate? That is age, rage, and the effective free fructose. Now we know that we consume fruit juices, we consume fruit salads, and we see the nutrient content, but we never see what is the effective free fructose of this fruit juice or the, or the milk and fruits we are consuming together or the fruits, juices and the uh, chicken or mutton we are consuming together in the breakfast. So there is an effective free fructose and these effective free fructose, which where the ratio goes one is to one, more than one is to one, has an impact on excess fructose, which has an impact on the hepatocytes of the liver, which can create inflammation, which can create uric acid as a byproduct. So these things are to be controlled very correctly. Then acrylamide-like substances, then carboxymethyl lysine, carboxyethyl lysine, these are the end products which get doesn't get metabolite, which gets accepted by the smooth muscles, and then they start becoming harder and harder and land into exaggerated aging into the tissues. So what, what are these? So tea with milk, a simple viruddhana, which is not at all advised. No, no science advised to drink tea with milk. That is strictly prohibited. Fruits with milk, non-veg processed with milk products, eating at night, that is against a chrononutrition that you are not supposed to eat at night because the melatonin levels are really very high, which shut down the biological clock at the hepatocyte levels. Reheating and refrying of the foodstuffs, eating when not at all hungry, indulging in overeating, that we have to think about the fructose age, we have to think about the lactose age, and if these two are absent, we should have think about the metabolism and digestion of the, that person which lands that food into the intestinal age that is the due to the wrong combination, though no, not wrongly processed, can create in advanced glycation end products. So these are the viruddhana or these are the non-compatibility of the food which should not be consumed. And again, the most important concept that is the abhishandiyahar, that is those substance when consumed will create inflammation at a cellular level and will not nourish the tissues properly. So those substance which create inflammation are not categorized into the food in Ayurveda and may have, these type of food may have even effect on unwanted effects on DNA, M mRNA, and specific genes, and uh, these substances are supposed to be abhishandi. So this is what is the inflammatory food is to be strictly prohibited. And <clears throat> the consideration of heaviness and lightness of the food particle, that's very important. That's why the digestibility index is to be considered, and that is to be matched with the phenotype of that person. Then and then only we can stop with uh, aging of the tissues very, very important thing, very important that we have forgotten that shipram jaragachiti ushnam ashniya, the food we should eat should be hot. It should be not reheated, but it should be fresh. That's very important. And they said that shipram jaragachiti, it will relieve aging very fast if you are eating fresh food. And then Bhagavad Gita answers, what do you mean by fresh food? Then snigdham akshya, shipram jaragachiti, Fats free food will aggravate aging. You can't be, your food can't be devoid of fats. Fats are very, very important, but due to certain fashions now, people are reducing with their fats, mainly with the saturated fats and medium chain, chain fatty, fatty acids. So these are also the important component of the food and that should be uh, the protein fats and uh, carbohydrate percentage should be matched as per the phenotype. So, but you can't be devoid of fat free food that will again aggravate aging. So. Again, processing again depends on type of utensils you are using. So see the thought process in those days, thousands of years back, they have told about the type of utensils we are using, amount of heat while preparing the food, that should be controlled heating, amount of water used for preparation of the food, processing of the food, a simple change, a 
pressure, rice prepared in the pressure cooker and the rice prepared in the open utensils have different glycemic index. We tell about, okay, stop with rice for the diabetic or the metabolic disorders. But what about people who are preparing out of utensils, in the open utensils, their glycemic index, we can drop down very nicely. Or if we bake the rice and then we process it and then we cook in the open, the, the glycemic index drops further. So processing of the food is also very important, which has been emphasized very nicely. And time of eating, that is duration as well as chrononutrition is to be focused very, very correctly. So a proper diet with proper processing and uh, sir, can you the, uh... pardon sir can you wind up please in uh, two minutes yeah yeah i'll wind up i'll wind up, I'll wind up. yeah so definitely Sorry, unscheduled please. food consumption is like to be harmful and <clears throat> i'll go to the some of the last slides so Time restricted eating is very, very important concept in Ayurveda and they have clearly mentioned that Sayam Pratar Manushanam Ashanam Chishutitam Nandar Bhojanam Kuryat Agnihotra Samovidi Yama Madhyena Bhoktavyam Yama Yugmam Na Langhayat Yama Madhyena Rasodpati Yama Gulmad So you have to keep a six hour difference between two meals and between each two meals you can eat after three hours and that can have a good impact on the insulin this is the research paper taken from the american pancreatic association and this matches with the quotations which has been mentioned in uh, ayurveda so effects of dieting we can we can see the whatever the diet ayurveda has propagated that has a good impact on the gut flora and definitely this diet also has an impact on the mind and they have said that the man who uses wholesome diet and behavior who moves cautiously, who is unattached to, unattached to the sensual pleasures, who do, donates, observes equality, who is truthful, who is forbearing. So not only the diet, but all these other factors are also important to stop or to uh, stop the aging effect on the tissues. So these factors are to be considered. Coming to the last slide, that Ayurveda, Bhagavad Gita has also elaborated regarding the food and the mind. And as mind has been uh, classified into three types, Sattva, Raja and Tama as per the Indian philosophy. So they, they have told that food cooked more than three hours before being eaten, which is tasteless, stale, putrid, decomposed and unclean can aggravate uh, aging. And that it has been said that that can land into diseases like Alzheimer's. So definitely the whatever the nutritional science has been elaborated in Ayurveda and which whatever is the modern nutritional science that can be co collaborated very nicely for the well-being of the society. Thank you. Thank you very much. I request uh, Dr. Veena. Dr. Veena, are you? Um, sorry, sir. I think uh, Veena ma'am has. Uh, I think she got uh, locked off. Yes. Uh, but thank you so much, Dr. Sapnis. It is such a um, charged session, I should say. And it's very interesting to know the difference in the concepts of Ayurvedic nutrition and modern nutritional science. I'm sure Dr. Kamala Krishnaswamy would like to add some points or no, share her thoughts on this. May I invite Dr. Kamala? Well, I don't think I have much to say except that if you compare the principles of uh, Ayurvedic medicine and the modern medicine, most of it is similar. It's not very different. Yes except perhaps when you come to individual components of the diet, there may be some differences. For example, uh, just now, uh, Dr. Sabne said that you should not be eating black gram and you should not be eating yogurt. Mm -hmm. Such small differences perhaps will be there. And I, re I would like to ask him the reason for it because the curd or the yogurt of course, yogurt is slightly different from the curd which we prepare at home. Uh, they are the only source of, um, I, I think, probiotics. Uh, unfortunately, we do all other foods we cook very well, so there is no question of any probiotic being alive. So this is the only uh, source for. Uh, a fermented foods in general, but if you boil it after fermenting it, then it's of no use. 
So why is it that all breakfast items in southern India at least are a combination of black gram with uh, rice or wheat or something like that? So why is it that you don't want black gram to be encouraged is one question. And the second yeah. is why you don't want curds or yogurt? So really these are two very important questions why black gram is not advised. Basically black gram is very rich with proteins and as per the Ayurveda concepts, it's very, very heavy to get digested. And as Ayurveda emphasize more on the digestibility of the food as well as the digestible, digestive capacity of the individual. So matching these two things, a person who have a sedentary lifestyle, who doesn't exercise regularly, for those people they have advised, for a common man, they have advised not to consume black gram in a regular fashion, which becomes very heavy to get digested first thing. Second thing regarding the curds, the type of curds people have at their home, they have different type of curds, different type of uh, bacteria are involved into it. And whatever the recent research paper, what we have studied is that, that the regular consumption of curds can increase the high sensitive C-reactive protein uh, after nearly 20 to 25 days. So that study has been undergone and that study shows that it can increase the inflammatory process or it can initiate the inflammatory process if it is consumed in a regular fashion. So that's why curds are not, curds like thing are not allowed. Considering about the probiotic, the diet, what they are promoting along with honey and all these things itself, it works as a probiotic because they have told to control the heating process on the food. So the food itself should work as a probiotic and the concept of probiotic is not at all in Ayurveda. They have thought that even curds, even milk, all these things, if they are taken in a proper manner, that should work as a probiotic and not only curds because curds and oh, even the paper has been published in two, uh, 2019 only, which shows that regular consumption of curd, not yogurt, regular consumption of curds can increase the in low inflammatory process in the humans. And that's why if low inflammatory process is initiated, then again, metabolic process goes on. So that's why Ayurveda might have told, again, much work, work is needed over that, but uh, it, that might be the one of the reason which can, even we can see that those arthritis people who eat, con consume curds regularly, they have inflammation on their joints in the morning. That is a regular experience as we are clinicians. So that is also one of the factor that increases CRP levels. And that's why inflammatory markers, that's why that may be the part that they might have told not to use it in a regular fashion. Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah I can. Uh, uh, sorry, I had a lot of problem uh, when he was finishing. Uh, see, sir, uh, really uh, on behalf of NSI Mumbai chapter, I wish to thank you so much for giving, you know, an excellent overview. I can understand, you know, half an hour is not enough for especially yeah. telling people who are, most of us are not from uh, Ayurveda background. And so, you know, what I, you know, I was just writing what gist of what you have said. You have very rightly said that uh, Ayurveda places special emphasis on ahara, that is diet and anna, that is food, as means to good life, food health, uh, good health and wellness. And nutrition plays a central role in Ayurvedic living. You also said that Ayurveda is about understanding your body and being who you are meant to be. I think you explained beautifully about some of the concepts like Agni, then about the inner aging, then armor, then biological age and chronological age should be the uh, same. Then about the Viruddha Ahar, processing of uh, foods and all. I know that uh, when we are, uh, you know, hardcore nutrition people, sometimes we don't agree many of uh, principles of uh, Ayurveda. But then I think because probably we do not have so much knowledge about that and maybe we wait for more published data and that's why probably you know we uh, don't follow certain things which are given in Ayurveda but Ayurveda is ancient medicine and you have very uh, nicely revealed some of the secrets of you know uh, uh, aging gracefully. Now there are some questions which have come to me and I would like to ask you those questions. One is that uh, uh, like you did mention about iron. Now see in our country uh, so many more than 50% of women and children are anemic. Now, after so many years of independence, having so many kinds of programs and all. So is there any re remedy in Ayurveda for, you know, 
uh, for this anemic people uh, 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 what can you suggest do yeah, you have yeah, any kind of medicine or do you suggest any plant or something actually that slide was added uh, yesterday only to this lecture regarding the program in anemia first thing i want to emphasize in the anemia what we are getting today though maybe in from the rural areas and from the urban areas anemia is nowadays to be categorized into anabolic disease that's very important that is not a, that that doesn't remain to be a catabolic disorder it, it has to be in a anabolic disorder and that again we have to focus on uptake of the nutrients and correcting the gut flora when we are treating anemia just giving ayurveda doesn't emphasize no doubt ayurveda has told about iron very correctly they have told about the ores of iron and how they, they that is to be converted into medicine and we also use iron preparations in ayurveda also but that is a limited scope for how many days we are going to give, give iron so we have to work on the gut flora we have to get on the intrinsic factors as per the ayurved medicine ayurved dietetics and ayurved medicines these intrinsic factors will definitely work on the uptake of iron and vitamin b uh, vitamin c and b12 that can improve the status of the person so di other dietary measures are to be controlled very nicely as per ayurved uh sir now for as part of national nutrition month this year even last year we are want to promote more of portion vatika kitchen gardens now okay. uh, suppose if i or home garden if i want to have you know a few pots in my house and want to have a kind of a kitchen garden what kind of uh, plants would you suggest from ayurveda angle that i should have yeah. in my house yeah, for yeah, my better health for for betterment of anemia one should have the plants like ginger very important then secondly pomegranate is very important amla is very important then resins are very important as per the ayurved theories which can increase the uptake of iron very nicely and thereafter consumption of uh, sugarcane juice they have advised consumption of sugarcane juice which is very very rich in uh, iron so these type of uh, sugarcane uh, juice iron it's rich in iron, iron. It's, it is rich in iron Mainly and they have promoted it so sugarcane juice then amla amla juice then resins then ginger because ginger is ginger or pepper they will be working to correct the intrinsic factors they are not rich source of iron but the correcting the intrinsic factor will increase the uptake of iron very correctly they will be working as a bioavailability enhancers for iron so these things are to be used along with iron or or in the food which can increase the iron uptake Can okay, I, sir. There's one I, more question. Can I, can I uh, add something? Yeah. The iron which is there in uh, sugar cane juice, or the iron which is there in the jaggery, they are yes. all not bioavailable. Not we should uh, we should no longer think that they are available for absorption. So even though the, it because of the contamination, there may be iron in it. They are not bioavailable. So I think we should not. Uh, promote sugar cane juice from the point of view of free sugar and inflammation and all chronic disorders and uh, i would certainly uh, do not want to say that it's a source of iron okay uh, sir just one more question uh, see it is all, often it is said that the uh, ayurvedic medicines or sometimes some herbs are given they have a lot of side effects so uh, you know like uh, uh, what uh, what do you say about that for ayurvedic medicine and can they be taken at any particular time or are there some restrictions that you can't take with particular kind of foods what do you say about it so it is very unfortunate that people feel that ayurvedic medicines don't have side effects ayurvedic medicines they have their own regimes they are to be taken in a stipulated dose they are to be taken under the supervisions of ayurvedic doctors unfortunately what has been there that ayurved medicines are taken with the self prescription they are not controlled at all and the lack the most important lacking thing is they are not standardized so all these things can bring ayurvedic side effects on the surface definitely ayurvedic medicines have their own side effects they are to be taken under medical supervision only so if people follow these things because many people they they have a self medication with ayurved they don't take prescriptions they study by their own and they have that prescription so definitely they have their side effects they have a very strong interactions with modern medicine drugs they have a very strong interactions with the food also unfortunately ayurvedic drugs and food interactions are not focused at all 
so these are to be focused very correctly and then and then only we can go further for the treatments of the patients sir are there a lot of uh, heavy metals in that lead and copper and I'm, chromium and I'm this not kind of uh, uh, you know in the ayurvedic medicine I'm okay. not getting you. I'm not getting. Why is this breaking? Ah, uh, sir. Uh, what I want to ask, like uh, it was yes. in between. It had come in the paper and somewhere. You know that Ayurvedic medicines have lot of heavy metals, like lead. Ah, uh, yeah, very and important. And which can question. cause problems. See, basically, Ayurvedic medicines are intently added for a pharmacologic activity with heavy metals. If I am putting mercury or lead into a medicine. and then i am analyzing the heavy metal that it has a mercury and it has a lead it is going to happen but these mercury and these lead they are first made into they are transformed into a non toxic forms for example if you see mercury mercury is given in in the form of mercury sulfide it is not given into the form of mercury chloride and mercury sulfide is not at all toxic and people they just analyze with the atomic absorption machine that how much mercury is there you have to find how much mercury sulfide is there into it and that is that is the thing which is okay. lacking between the modern research and ayurved people there is a big gap between these two things okay uh, i think dr sachin uh, wanted to ask a question sir sir did you have a question uh, because i saw your video on in between uh, when i think you can uh, put off your video probably to save the bandwidth otherwise it is not actually we cannot hear you completely your voice is breaking yeah your video you put uh, shut down your video you can put off your video we can't hear you at all it's muted Chandni, can you unmute, ma'am? Uh, ma'am, I think uh, Shashi Karan sir had a question. Ah, uh, yes, I can hear now. I think I was kept on mute because I'm uh, entering through another device. Yeah. Uh, see, I think Doctor Shashi Karan had a question. Yeah. I I saw him in between his video on. Yeah. So yeah. with that, that should be the last question, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm just asking a question to show you that I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, no, I was. Uh, it was a nice talk, sir. But, but uh, there are some concepts which I am not able to understand. Yeah. And uh, that, about what uh, Madam Kamala also asked about curd and uh, curd not being advisable. I know that Ayurveda definitely ad uh, advises buttermilk, as yeah. uh, it's uh, that it is that is good for health. But uh, the only thing a uh, buttermilk is just. Uh, diluted form of the curd and so if buttermilk is okay i don't know why curd is not okay but i'm sure there must be some yeah, reason yeah, behind it and uh, when it comes to the discussion about uh, probiotics uh, most of the curds which we make at home do not have probiotic bacteria uh, and uh, therefore we don't get the benefit of probiotic there may be some cultures uh, which are specifically lactobacillus cultures which always most of the bacteria in our uh, fermented foods get killed by the gastric acidity intestine and they don't survive and then don't fit into the definition but apart from all that fermented foods anyway have a tremendous benefit we all agree and uh, regarding this inflammation in fact right now we are all looking for ayurveda and plant products which can suppress inflammation Uh, we have enough pro-inflammatory things going on in our food and our lifestyle uh, that we are looking. Are there any ways of changing our diet or lifestyle to reduce that inflammation? So Ayurveda may be able to help us uh, provide that kind of a knowledge about some of the herbs and uh, other things which can reduce uh, inflammation, and we will welcome yeah. that. And regarding the heavy metal thing, I, I agree with you, sir. In fact, I have done. along with my colleagues lot of study toxicological studies on what we call as basmas these basmas are the ones like uh, as you said mercury or lead or uh, any iron any many of these and these are processed over several times of heating and cooling and heating and cooling along with the herbs so when they follow that proper procedure over time we found that these basmas are not toxic even though as you said using an atomic absorption or icpm as we can demonstrate the presence of the metal 
the metal form is not toxic but our only worry is in the market when people access these foods how are we sure that the manufacturer followed those traditional processes or did he find any shortcuts because you know now that you know nobody is willing to wait to prepare 10 grams of a ayurvedic basma over 10 months period they would like to do it in one month so they will heat and cool heat and cool in our furnaces which will not have the same thing so it is a little risky for us to you know uh, source these things and therefore the metal toxicity is a problem in poorly prepared ayurvedic preparations if they are well prepared i don't think there is such a problem thank you sir ravi i learned a lot today from all the speakers thank you thank you sir thank you so one thing i want to answer is that that uh, regarding the buttermilk what is the difference between buttermilk it is buttermilk or curd it is not at all advised throughout the year buttermilk is also not not advised throughout the year certain circadian uh, rhythms are followed while using such type of food products and buttermilk is advised only in certain seasons like uh, sharad rutu means now coming season that is maybe uh, october november only in those days buttermilk is advised and other days buttermilk is not openly advised to all the people so there is no doubt it is a dilution it it may work as a probiotic we are also finding at a uh, means at a uh, analytical level that what is the exact difference between the effects of buttermilk and curds so they have told that buttermilk is more and more anti inflammatory and curd is inflammatory that that uh, that what we are getting from the texts but actually we are working still today that how the property of anti inflammatory changes to inflammatory when it comes to curds so this is again in the process we are working lot on it and definitely will come out with the answer uh, yes uh, thank you so much sir i think uh, it requires a separate session ayurveda has its own angle i yeah, think and we are looking for more pleasure. published data um, we are waiting for more published data but our science of nutrition says otherwise and so but it's good to know what is the angle of uh, ayurveda so uh, thank you very much sir for uh, taking us through uh, ayurveda and uh, explaining to us about the various aspects we need to read more and understand because people do ask us whenever we talk about uh, you know prescribed diet then they do ask about certain things uh, related to ayurveda so thank you so much and we will definitely have another session it was lovely to have you here sir for sparing thank such uh, your valuable time and uh, taking us through uh, ayurveda thank you so much thank you thank, thank you so much and over to you dr lakshmi now I'd like thank to you. thank dr sashikaran and dr kamla krishna swami for actually pitching and then giving their valuable inputs and adding uh, the, some more information and their knowledge extensive knowledge to this talk and this is our first venture actually to try out and know uh, learn more about ayurveda because with the government focusing more and more on ayush and uh, the, yeah, yeah. the uh, in, interest in people about knowing more about ayurveda and nutrition that has led us think of having one session from a qualified uh, ayurvedic expert so that is how we have had this session today and i think we have to converge more in future uh, with more scientific background thank you so much sir for adding you, you. on our behalf thank you thank you over to you dr lakshmi thank you dr sabnis dr veena dr neha dr sasikaran and subhadra madam for that wonderful discussion and deliberation uh, i'm afraid we are running short of time so i will call upon uh, dr rupali sen gupta to deliver the vote of thanks madam is an active lec member and she is also the coordinator of the masters program of clinical nutrition and dietetics at dr bmn college over to you rupali ma'am thank you dr lakshmi uh, with warm regards to all i dr rupali sen gupta from dr bmn college of home science and the office bearer of uh, uh, nsi mumbai chapter would like to take the opportunity to extend my gratitude to all the people involved in making this webinar a grand success i would like to start by thanking our keynote speaker for today dr kamla krishna swami and our experts dr tetiana rocks dr kathy greaves and dr mukund sabris for such an enriching and interesting session thank you all for accepting our invite and spending your time for today's webinar in order to observe the national nutrition month now i in uh, i will i would brief everybody 
and the takeaway message for from today's uh, proceeding i have compiled and i am going to present you all in nutshell so starting with the keynote speaker uh, where the topic was on an overview on the aging and nutrition so ma'am has very explicitly explained on the aging is a vital demographic uh, uh truth and a healthy diversified nutrient dense diet and physical activity can delay aging with the government policies needs to be uh, taken as a collaborative venture holistic multi dimensional inputs need to promote the healthy aging uh, and improve the quality of the life ma'am has also spoken on the hallmark of aging policies and programs need uh, assessment and updation smart technology as an elderly as for the elderly as an interactive device to promote functional independence care and access to health care should be viewed as a fundamental rights for elderly thank you ma'am for your uh, such an explicit explicit session uh, today you have delivered now coming to dr priyana uh, who has uh, spoken about aging nutrition and mental health Uh, Ma'am has spoken about on food and mood center. Chronic inflammation leads to neuro degenerative and uh, uh, depression. Mind diet, which is a combination of Mediterranean and DASH diet, to prevent inflammation. Relationship between brain derived neurotropic factor, which is present in uh, the hippocampus, and in association with the poor diet and the stress level. Ma'am also emphasized on the gut brain axis psychobiotics. to improve the gut microbiome and the neurological funct function now coming to dr kathy who spoke on the uh, understanding the protein needs for healthy aging consumption of adequate amount of high quality protein at every meal combined with physical acti activity is mandatory additional protein are required as we age low protein intake is a predictor of sarcopenia and frailty a uh, significance of leucine amino acid as it builds lean muscle and the mechanism very interestingly uh, elaborated hence maintain protein uh, uh, in the diet along uh, as the age progresses the ayurveda and holistic nutrition very uh, upcoming uh, field uh, dr sabdis uh, who have explained very uh, nicely about the topic and he started that yes feeding smart right from start is an essence in today's life diet and lifestyle to be maintained mind and so along with the mind soul and the sensory organs therapeutics which promote strength and immunity is rishya and growth along with the growth promotion and stabilization to be taken care of concept of aging in ayurveda with the terminology sir you have used in everything we need to learn more into that inflammatory diets the inflammatory markers how it gets aggravated if the diet uh, is not properly pro followed eating to promote eating healthy to promote aging fasting leads to feasting and types of uh, vessels which is uh, which should be uh, one should know while they cook food and uh, and also the duration of eating hours uh, fat free food will aggravate aging likewise he has also emphasized on many uh, useful topics on the food mind and health and uh, with this uh, this i would like to thank our dr professor mala pandurang principal of dr bmn college for always motivating us to conduct such interesting uh, webinar would like to thank our eminent member uh, i should not say in the audience within us from the nsi family only dr shashi karan thank you sir for sparing your time and honor, honoring us with your presence i would like to thank our sponsors kellogg's india for supporting the idea and helping us to spread the knowledge to our audience i would also like to th thank dr subhadra mandalika convener and other lec uh, members from mumbai chapter for being the strongest support to our team i would like to extend my gratitude towards mrs vinaya Vashem Payan, Head Department of Food Science and Nutrition of Dr. B M N College, Dr. Veena Yardi, Treasurer of N S I Mumbai Chapter, Ms. Madhvi uh, Sathe, Head Department of Nutrition and Meal Management from Shri Mati M M P Shah College of Arts and Commerce. I would like to extend my thanks to the social media team of N S I Mumbai Chapter, without whom we definitely cannot run the show. So may it be today's seminar or any webinar. A special thanks to Ms. Sonu Mishra and Dr. Lakshmi Menon from Dr. B M N College of Home Science for making today's session possible and successful. I would like to thank the audience for your active participation and patience uh, listening. Thank you once again to all. Have a good weekend. 
stay safe and, uh, and stay healthy. Uh, over to you, Dr. Lakshmi Menon, for further uh, announcement for the certificates. Thank you, Dr. Rupali, for those valuable messages. Uh, we've had them imprinted in our minds um, before. I know time is a constraint, but however, uh, following today's webinar, I have a few instructions for our wonderful audience. Uh, Farheen, please. Yes, the feedback form link that all of you have been much awaiting is open now, so you can start filling the form up and it will be open till tomorrow midnight, 11.59 p.m. So please start filling those forms up. We love your feedback and it helps us get through our sessions one on one. Uh, we also request that you await the certificates till the 18th of September. Please do not be impatient. They will reach you before the 18th. Um, and make sure you download and save your certificates in the Google Drive as soon as you receive the link. This program has been recorded on YouTube, so whenever you want to re-imprint those messages in your mind, they are available on YouTube. And to add to this, we also, in our endeavor to promote and provide uh, activities relating to nutrition, we have three upcoming activities. We look forward to your participation in all of these. Number one, to raise up those culinary skills. We have an innovative low salt, low sugar recipes contest, the details of which are available on our social media space. We look forward to having you participate. Next, please. We also have a wonderful seminar lined up on the 18th of September with the keynote addressed by none other than Dr. Shashikaran, who was lovely enough to join us today. And we look forward to hearing you speak, sir, on the 18th of September. This is also in association with the Manibain Nanavati Women's College, Mumbai and Kellogg's Nutrition. So do uh, check our social media space for the registration forms and make sure you register before the 16th of September. And we also, I would like to announce that we also have an online course in nutritional psychiatry in collaboration with the Deakin University Australia, which is scheduled in November of 2021. So again, do wait, watch our social media spaces for all the updates and we look forward to your wonderful participation for the same. I do hope your families and your loved ones are safe happy and healthy. And let's look forward to taking this portion Ma, in our stride to come in our everyday lives. Thank you very much once again to all of you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.